<laughs> the highways and the byways. <laughs> the highways and byways. We are? Okay. Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> Let's open with prayer. Almighty and ever living God, our Father, blessed be your holy name. We come to you tonight in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the power of the Holy Ghost, praying that our work this evening might be pleasing in your sight. May we in our hearts tonight sanctify Christ as Lord and always be prepared to give a defense of our faith to everyone who asks about the reason for the hope that is in us. By your grace, may we respond to them in meekness and fear, since though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God, for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Help us, O Lord our God, to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Now to that end, may our speakers tonight and I give glory to you alone. Amen. Welcome everyone. Come in. Please take a seat. <clears throat> Allow me to uh, begin tonight by asking you to please remember there will be a question and answer time immediately after the presentations from 8.30 to 9 p.m. If you're here in person, you'll be given an opportunity to ask questions uh, directly to any of the uh, presenters. And if you're live streaming, you can submit your questions online. Is that correct, Alan? Yes, I'm getting a thumbs up. Allow me to say that what we're trying to accomplish with these apologetics conferences is a building up of the body of Christ, the church, here in the South Bay and beyond. We hope to help Christians learn to apply the word of God to every area of life, equipping them to give a defense to everyone who asks about the reason for the hope that is within us with gentleness and respect. That's 1 Peter 3.15. So with that, uh, we begin tonight uh, with a presentation by Dr. Eddie Anorga entitled Zero Too Many. Is that on the screen? There it is. Zero Too Many. Dr. Eddie Anorga has been attending Branch of uh, Hope for close to seven years and recently became a ruling elder. He leads two midweek Bible studies and has been involved in ministry to youth, <coughs> excuse me, to youth and young adults uh, in Haiti since uh, 2010. He enjoys studying apologetics, theology, and culture. He has been married for 42 years and has uh, three grown children and five grandchildren. He is also a family physician and has practiced in the South Bay for over 30 years. Dr. Eddie and Jason Gallagher work together several times a week to discuss apologetics, theology, and current affairs. So with that, please welcome my good friend and ruling elder, Dr. Eddie Anorga. That's my claim to fame. I work out with Jason Gallagher three times a week, just in case you weren't impressed yet. Um, so the title of my presentation today is Zero Too Many. Uh, and I'll be looking at three different perspectives on reality or theism, atheism, uh, which is the belief that, well, we'll get into it, that there is no God. Uh, Taoism, which is kind of a binary system, and polytheism. Um, Bob will be taking look at, a look at monism, or you know, th particularly through the form of Buddhism, and Daniel will be giving us um, information about Trinitarianism or biblical Trinitarianism. 
Um, if you hold to one of these views, you know, I hope that today's talk will give you an opportunity to kind of reflect on some of the precepts within your worldview. Um, and uh, um, and yeah, if you haven't realized it, you are a religious person. All people have religious constructs that kind of guide them through their decision making throughout the day. Uh, there are things that they they take for granted or believe or that they can't verify that guide them through their thinking. If you're a if you're a Christian, hopefully today's presentation will help you. Um, uh, strengthen your understanding of what other people are thinking so that when you're dialoguing with them and having conversation with them, you can help, you can stay focused on the things that are important and understand a little bit about something that other people believe. So before we dive into it, I want to just define theism uh, because it's really important that we understand theism as something objective. As Christians, we believe that theism refers to the triune God of Scripture that has revealed himself through the Scripture. And this is kind of a unique thing. As you look through other writings for other religions, you don't really get this sense that there is a God who's revealing himself um, through his revelation. Um, we know that the clearest revelation of the God of Scripture is through Jesus Christ. Uh, after all, he's the exact representation of his glory. And if we have seen him, we have seen the Father. God also reveals himself through general revelation, through the things that are made. And these uh, general re revelation is accurate. Uh, it's our interpretation of general revelation that is problematic. We seem to have this very powerful truth-suppressing mechanism that leads us to uh, worship something created instead of the creator himself. All this to say is that the triune God of Scripture has a specific and objective identity. He and his word are not the product of subjective personal speculation. He is who he is. That's where, well, the name is I am who I am. From the Scriptures, we learn that God is both transcendent and imminent, uh, that he's both personal and absolute. He's transcendent in his power and authority, and he's imminent um, through his word and his spirit. Unfortunately, amongst our culture, theum has been diluted. The term itself can mean many different things. Um, so there's a lot of subjectivism. Typically, it's borrowing something from the biblical worldview, some attribute of God, some transcendence, uh, some unusual authority or power that's being attributed to something that's created. And some of these take the form of spiritual authorities. Others include concepts or even individuals that serve as the ultimate authority or authorities in plural. Uh, before we get into atheism, I need to make a confession. Uh, I kind of am attracted to a lot, a lot of the tenets that many atheists hold. Um, you know, atheists like reason and rationality. I, I kind of like reason and rationality. Um, atheists, many atheists really like science, and I, I really like science. Um, atheists have this sense of rebellion, you know, that, that uh, they want to rebel and not follow the crowd. Yet with every rebellion, you form an allegiance to something or someone that's opposing what you're rebelling against. As Christians, we're peacefully rebelling against the ways of the world and become follower, becoming followers of Jesus Christ. Atheists ultimate rebel, ultimately rebel against the triune God of Scripture, and they follow something that is created. Frequently, atheism is thought as the belief that there is no God, uh, including the triune God of Scripture. Smarter atheists think about this, and they say, well, we don't really have the intellectual capital to make that kind of claim. I'd be putting myself in a kind of a, a if you give myself a quality of God omniscience, which I don't really have, in order to say that, well, yeah, I've looked in every dimension, and I understand all things, and I know for certain that there is no God. No reasoning atheist is going to make that kind of claim. So they've kind of retreated to a more empirical, some of them repeated 
retreated to a more empirical thing is that, well, there's not really enough evidence for the support of God. And when they start thinking about, well, does, you know, does, does empiricism, can it really justify our knowledge? And can, do we make all kinds of commitments um, that aren't empirically based? They tend to, tend to re retreat from empiricism to some form of agnosticism. You know, that, well, you can't really know whether there's a God or not. And, and they end up in this position of they saying, I certainly, I know for certain that you can't know for certain. And I'm absolutely sure that, that uh, there's no absolute truth. And that's absolutely true. Regardless, at the end of all that, they end up worshiping something created instead of the creator. So what are some of the transcendent claims um, that, include, that are included in the atheist worldview? Um, yet, yeah, whether you've thought of it or not as an atheist, you're part of a, a, a worldview or a religious system. And it comes with several control beliefs that serve as authoritative determiners of your other subordinate beliefs, you know, what you think about, what's important to you, how you live your life. They also guide your emotions, your actions, and your desires. These transcendent authorities are frequently hidden or not really considered or identified. And when you see that you start to group together with people regarding relationships that are centered around these transcendent beliefs, you begin to understand that atheism or certain segments of atheism function as loosely formed religious groups. People get together with people that have like-minded beliefs, you know, particularly these control beliefs, these more important beliefs, and talk about those important beliefs and develop resources to carry out whatever these important beliefs lead them to believe. They form, they, um, these loosely formed religious organizations also develop a hierarchy with people at the top who have some degree of transcendent or higher knowledge than people at the bottom. They also develop inclusion and exclusion criteria. You know, you can be belong to our group if you believe in A, B, C, D, but if you believe this, you know you're really not part of our group. Uh, they also develop a whole variety of different virtue signal signals that if you do this, do that, then that demonstrates your outward commitment to the religious group that you belong to. Uh, finally, you know, this degree of commitment can become so strong that it'll get in the way of your family, of your friends, your relationships, your jobs, your job, and even your life. Look at me, I, my jobs, I have so many jobs. It's like, I don't think of a job as a singular thing. Um, but I can already see an objection forming to this religious analysis of atheism and that really, you know, many atheists view themselves as really objective scientists. Uh, that sets them apart from all those other people who believe in things that aren't seen, the unseen things. So let's take a moment to digress and take a look at, well, what is science? Science really is just a word for knowledge. And uh, basically in our culture, science has to do with the idea that we can learn about reality by studying the creation, um, that we can reason about uh, the things that are seen in this uh, uh, repetitive and controlled environment, and that leads us to some understanding. It's very simple. You take this, you know, you observe this thing, you drop it several times, and you go like, yeah, if you let go of the bottle, it's gonna most likely, very high likely, almost certain to fall to the ground. Uh, that's kind of science. Science gets a lot of traction in areas like physics and chemistry. Uh, it starts to lose traction as it moves into other fields, particularly like, say, medicine or in uh, uh, sociology and other areas. And that is because there's so many variables that start to enter that it's difficult to control all the variables, and it's hard to know with a great deal of certainty. In medicine, we've had to say, yes, 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 and then we go, well, maybe, 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 and then we gotta say, no, no, no. And so that's happened several times in my short span of practice in 30 years. Um, the other issue with science is that there is an authority-based structure. Not everybody can know everything about everything. So you have to rely on some other people. People come to me, they rely on my knowledge of medicine to kind of help them make decisions about their health care. 
Um, and I, in turn, rely on other people that are more involved in the study of, say, high cholesterol or certain types of cancer or other specialized area to give me uh, understanding so how could I can advise others. Um, so anyways, in this, you can see the structure of there's people, this kind of transcendent structure where we, by faith, believe, you know, what the uh, cholesterol specialists tell us. Um, frequently, the disciples, me being one of them, um, follow unproven speculations with irrational religious fervor. You know, we really tell people, you got to take this cholesterol medicine and, you know, whatever. Um, we saw this recently when science actually took on flesh. I don't know if you guys saw it. It was kind of like the incarnation when, you know, this one character de uh, declared that he is the embodiment of science. And uh, he went ahead and told us that certain vaccines were safe and effective before he had any long-term data to support safety and efficacy. Uh, and when, when, when time goes by and these vaccines show that they're not really as safe and efficacious as they say, uh, they continue to hold on to the beliefs uh, and they, people, the followers tend to hold on to the demigods' uh, precepts until it becomes almost completely indefensible. At that point, sometimes they, resolve, they, they let go of it and they come to the realization and become redeemed by saying that science is evolving. And after all, evolution sounds like a very scientific term. So, you know, it, it doesn't really harm your idea of, 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 uh, of science is that, well, science is evolving. What we said two years ago is really now totally false. The demigods of scientism also overstep their limitations when they begin to require you to do things. Although science is very good at telling us what will happen, it's not very good at telling us what we ought to do. So once, once scientists begin to um, cross that along um, and suggest that you um, ought to do something, they begin to coerce you and they begin to command you to follow their transcendent moral precepts, you can see that this is some form of religion. In the sciences, within atheism, the scientist is not the only demigod. We'll, we'll see that there's a bunch of other demigods that are around. Um, and I kind of like to think of this as polytheistic atheism. I know that's an irrational sense of words, but so who cares, you know? There's no, it doesn't really matter. Uh, you know, sometimes it's the rock star, and you'll see people who just you know, they're, they kind of listen to some music and I'm going to live my life according to those lyrics. You know, imagine there's no heaven. Um, you know, I'm, I'm going to live my life according to that. Uh, the, it could be the sports star, you know, that they go out and they say something. I always like it when the movie star gives medical advice, you know. Uh, some people follow the news anchor, the professor, Marianne. Gilligan and his wife. Uh, there's even storybook. <laughs> there's even storybook characters, you know, that give you religious advice. Uh, they're all feeding us these subjectively filter pseudo truths, and it's pretty much what we read about about being conformed to the world. You know that they're constantly feeding us these pseudo transcendent truths that shape our control beliefs those beliefs that kind of guide all of our other beliefs. So what's the uh, product of this intellectual polytheism that forms you know, somewhat, of, somewhat of a religion? It's somewhat of a tribal anarchy. You see that developing in our culture right now. You have these groups, these tribes of people that are loosely formed. You know, they have some you know, kind of a statement. Some don't have any statements. They're loosely formed. You might be Antifa. You might be Black Lives Matter. They form these tribes. Uh, it may be cl climate, you know, climate activists, or it might be some other thing. They form a tribe, and they get together, and they work out inclusion, exclusion, criteria. They have hierarchies. You know, they virtue signal. They go out and, you know, slash tires or do whatever it is that they like to do at night. Uh, they fly in their jets to uh, climate conferences and those kinds of things. Um, and so... Um, 
Um, this creates this tribal anarchy, and this typically doesn't last very long, and a tyrant needs to step in. There has to be some leader that steps in and takes over, and either you're going to be a tyrant or you're going to be a little mini tyrant. You've probably met those people before. They're usually behind a counter somewhere, and they have control about whether or not you're going to do this or do that, and they just like, they lay down the law for you, and unless you do what they say, you're not going to get what you want. Uh, uh, eventually, if you're not a tyrant, a mini tyrant, you become a serf. You know, you become kind of a slave to the system, this underling that's just there for the purposes of achieving the goal. Um, so now let's turn the tables a minute and look at polytheism. That's the belief that there are many gods, which a word itself is kind of like leisure suit or dry water or something. It just doesn't really make sense because you know, theism really refers to an ultimate authority, and it's kind of hard to have many ultimate authorities. It kind of goes against the term ultimate. We learn about polytheism through Greek mythology, and there are many transcendent beings with amplified properties. They're like man, but they can fly, or they got control of the ocean, or they can do special things. Hinduism is a religion that's practiced in many parts of the world, and its teachings include karma, yoga, meditation, and reincarnation. Uh, the teachings of Hinduism in, uh, influence a lot of New Age thought, and even some of the stuff influences many churches. You know, you see churches um, uh, embracing some of these views. Its precepts are devised from, derived from these ancient writings, the Vedas and the Upanishads and many others. And they are not limited to just metaphysical issues, but they also address basic sciences and medicine. Some of you may have heard about or go to an Ayurvedic doctor, you know, that they, they practice medicine based on these principles that come from these writings. One concept in Hinduism is self-realization, and that is that through various beliefs and practices, you can navigate the caste system through many reincarnations and karma, and after a series of those reincarnations, you get in touch with your Atman, or your true spiritual soul. Um, that ultimately gets you into contact with Brahman, who's like the kind of the God concept within Hinduism, the ultimate ruling hyper-transcendent principle or person of the universe. That's all you can pretty much say about it. Um, at this point, uh, you all get to be one, create, one with the creative energy of the universe, and you get to hang out in this mysterious place called Nirvana. Uh, along the way, you can choose a god that manifests it is some kind of manifestation of Brahma to help you focus on self-realization. -real if, um, if you can't find one that, you can't find a God that meets your specifications, your, some sects actually allow you to make up a God, you know, that you can have to focus your next phase of realization. I know this is somewhat confusing, so if you get confused, you can get a guru. Uh, and a guru will help you, guide you through this whole process of deciding what it is, we, we had a, a family member who had a guru, and uh, he was kind of like a quasi-nutritionist guru guy, and I think he finally got him to, to start drinking his urine. Um, <laughs> all right. Um, and, uh, um, and, you know, if you don't like your guru, you could just find another one. They're kind of exchangeable. Um, and so, as you can see, this is... Uh, you know, what begins with a seemingly objective worldview or belief system, there is so much subjectivity built into it. And even if you appeal to some objective standards or writings, they're so voluminous and tedious to read that the average person doesn't do that, and they have to rely on, uh, on the, uh, the guru or some person in the hierarchy to tell you what these things mean. I mean, if you think about it, up until the 80s, the literacy rate in India was only 40%. And so pretty much everybody, you know, a lot of people were really, most of their focus was trying to get a meal for them and their, for themselves and their family. And they really didn't have a lot of time to sit around and read these things and contemplate them. Um, and again, the big idea is that if subjectivism reigns, so does intellectual and tribal anarchy 
and eventually the historical consequences of this is tyranny. Uh, there's one other just comment I wanted to make about Mormonism. Mormonism um, is, you know, begins kind of with the Bible, but then they add, begin to add a, a lot of this revelation that comes through one person. And some of it has been thoroughly debunked in terms like the Book of Abraham, which was a scroll written in hieroglyphics that uh, Joseph Smith translated. And, uh, and he wrote this whole story from this, from he thought it was a language called Reformed Egyptian. And he made a whole translation of it and wrote a book. It's one of their primary authoritative books. Uh, turns out when they got the Rosetta Stone and they, you know, deciphered, well, what is it that, uh, that uh, you know, this says it had nothing to do with what Joseph Smith wrote. Um, so anyways, Mormonism, if you're Mormon, if you do all the right things and follow all the right precepts, the belief is that you will become a god for another planet. And so it really mainly means is that there's an infinite regression of gods, both backwards and forwards. And you start to wonder, well, then, you know, who's the top? top dog you know it's like there's no ultimate authority so there's a sense in which mormon mormons are polytheists and really polytheism is again atheism with a capital t um so if you're having trouble with all these maybe the issue isn't uh, you know polytheism or atheism maybe it's dualism so the next section of my talk has to do with uh Taoism. Frequently, it's pronounced Taoism, so people go back and forth. Some people call it Taoism, Taoism. And it's a, it's a product of two writers from about 500 B.C., maybe, uh, Lao Tzu and Zhong Zi. Uh, it may just be a collection of writings and sayings and poems that were put together over the years and given this, mis this mystical origin. Uh, in Cuban culture, we have a kind of a mystical character. His name's called Pepito. And, uh, and you know, we ascribe a lot of really important things to Pepito, and he's the, he's the, the focus of many stories. Uh, everybody in Cuba knows about Pepito, but nobody's actually ever met him. Um, one of the essential features of Taoism is expressed in yin yang, which will come up in my slide, hopefully right now. You've all seen this. Uh, you know, it's these two interacting things. Uh, on one side, there's lightness. The other one's darkness. Uh, there's, you know, weakness and strength. There's fullness and emptiness. There are all these opposing ideas that somehow come together. And if you can see that there's a white dot within the black and a black dot within the white, there's this idea that, that there's a little bit of one thing in the other and a little bit of the other thing in the one. And so they're not completely separate. You know, as you kind of start to look at this from a distance, you almost see this dialectic de developing. And dialectical thinking is, uh, is what um, uh, Hegel, thank you, Hegel came up with. And there's another guy, I think his name's Karl Marx, who came up with this thing called dialectical materialism. And this kind of you know, this kind of idea can be molded a little bit into this dialectical materialism uh, idea. And one of the things that we're seeing in, uh, in China is that they're allowing certain religious beliefs, but they're conforming them to their political agenda. You know, and so we see that a little bit in the church. You know, we see, we see liberation theology as kind of Christianity that's, that's being conformed to Marxist ideology, and it has Christian symbols and Christian things, but underneath is this uh, demonic uh, idea. Anyways, uh, Taoists like to practice Tai Chi. Sometimes it's called Tai Chi, so it's either Taoism, Taoism, or Tai Chi, or Tai Chi. Anyways, uh, it's hard to know. It, this is a series of philosophically influenced movements that help you balance the flow of Qi energy through your body. Acupuncture seeks to diagnose and treat problematic flows of qi energy in your body. Feng Shui is a way of organizing objects in your environment in order to have the right flow of qi energy through around you. And there's people, I heard of a guy who, you know, he had built this, I don't know, huge mansion up on the hill and uh, some of his family members got sick and he uh, hired a Feng Shui uh, 
consultant because he thought the reason that they were getting sick is that somehow the architecture of the house uh, was not allowing the right flow of chi through the house. And so I think he spent another seven or eight million dollars just redoing the house to get the right feng shui. Uh, some of you have probably heard of Sun Tzu, which is out of war, uh, the arts of war. Uh, and Taoism has influenced a lot of Western thought leaders, including Carl Jung, Wayne Dyer, and even Jordan Peterson. Taoism has both a philosophical and religious faction. Uh, we all know they're we all know they're religious, both the philosophical and the religious gr group. Uh, but the traditional distinctions are usually drawn a lot in the line as whether or not they appeal to hidden or even revealed spiritual uh, uh, properties or otherwise the philosophical ones um, have these sage-like figures that have transcendent knowledge themselves. I have to make another confession. Um, as I read through a lot of the proverbs and saying of Taoist writers, they seem to be attractive. You know, there's a lot of things that go, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I kind of like that. Some of you might even say, well, that, that sounds even biblical. You know, there's like certain things that are in there um, that are attractive. Um, some of the sayings, is, it says, respond intelligently even to unintelligent treatment. Yeah, that kind of makes sense. Um, Nature doesn't hurry, yet everything is accomplished. Yeah, that's kind of nice, you know, things are going to just work together and you don't have to be anxious. Um, the best fighter is never angry. Well, that, that sounds pretty good. I think a lot can be learned by serious reflection and observation from the things that God has created, that general revelation that we talked about at the beginning. What seems to be lacking, though, is any kind of epistemic justification and definition in terms, leaving us with the usual vacuous terminology of enlightenment, truth, love, and justice. Well, what are those? Tao itself can be translated as the way, and therefore, being it it's the way, there is some normative standard. So, which is the way? Well, if you start to talk to people in Taoism and read what they say, they've been debating about whether the way really exists. They debate whether it can be known. If it does exist, we, whether we can know it. And they even declare that, well, if you know the way, you can't really express it in words. And so again, here comes all the subjectivity. We can see that there's this polytheistic underlying, these, these low-level authorities that kind of lead you through, that, that, that affect your control beliefs. Um, so you can see again with Taoism, that certain forms of anarchism, and within Taoism, there's certain force of anarchism and withdrawal. You know, there's this whole idea that, well, you can go live, you can go live, you know, in the country and grow your own food, kind of keep to yourself and not really have a contact. And then there are also segments of Taoism that um, endorse a strict authoritarianism. So when you begin with two loosely defined non-personal forces, this, uh, guiding the course of reality, it's really hard to find a patch of soil that isn't real sandy. Um, a great deal of subject subjectivism weakens any sense of objective standard to unify us and guide us by these precepts. Um, so I wanted to end just with a little table, and it's going to be an introduction to our next talk, which is going to be on the justification of knowledge. And Jason and I have been playing around with this. And actually, the list gets very long. And so if you're evaluating your worldview, you might want to ask yourself some questions. And these questions, these big questions have to do is like the origins. Where did everything come from? And how did we get here, the journey? You know, how did we get to where we are? How is it that we ought to live our lives? You know, what should, in light of everything, how is it that we ought to live our lives? What's going to happen in the temporal future? And, and what's going to happen after we die in the eternal future? Um, so those are all claims that a lot of worldviews seem to hold. And God has given us certain truth testers to help us understand. And one of those is just rationality. And rationality has kind of a twofold thing. 
One means that there's no contradictions, that things are well identified and have meaning, and that they have content. So sometimes when I think about irrationality, I think is that it's lacking any content. And so we'll probably hear a little bit about that, but some of these terms lack content. You know, that they're, they lack meaning, you know, nirvana. Well, what is that? Well, you can't really say anything about it. Uh, you know, Brahman, well, what can you, we can't really know that much. He's hyper transcendent. Uh, so they're, they're somewhat incontinent terms. Um, correspondence is another one, you know, it's like, do, do our beliefs correspond with the things that we see? Um, the third one there is comprehensive. And basically, how broad, you know, how broad does our worldview uh, dis, you know, cover these major questions? Um, and then how certain, you know, how, how, can we, how, how certain can we be about our beliefs about these things? And finally, pragmatism, and that is, can we live our lives in a way that, uh, uh, that, that's prescribed by these different worldviews? As we transition into Bob's talk, you know, one of the things about uh, Buddhism or Buddhist belief is that there are no distinctions. Well, that pretty much starts to destroy rationality uh, and that everything is illusion, even that fast bus that's coming at you. So you don't really have to look as you step off the curb. On that note, I'll turn it over to Bob and uh, he'll tell us about how we can all become one with the bus. <clears throat> Thanks, Dr. Eddie. Let's see, let me look at my notes here. Aha, our second presentation tonight is One is the Loneliest Number, Monism. As you can see on the screen, uh, Bob Peruca is a native of Southern California and received a master's degree in religious studies from UCSB. He has been a Christian now for 20 years and has been interested in the subject of comparative religions and worldviews since he was in college. When Bob became a Christian some 20 years ago, his primary interests shifted to Christian apologetics. He is currently a ruling elder here at Branch of Hope Orthodox Presbyterian Church and makes his home in El Segundo with his wife, Linda. So with that, I'll ask my friend and elder, Bob Peruca, to come forward. Thank you, Lars. Good to see everybody here, and um, I just want to thank everybody for coming tonight. This is uh, really good to see everybody. And I also want to thank our trusty technical crew, John Allen and Don Sprague, who's not here tonight. We really appreciate their, their selfless work. Um, yeah. I'd like to start out, for context, with... Romans 119 through 25, an oft-cited passage in Scripture. Hear now the word of God. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and righteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For all they, although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up in the lusts of their heart to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. So, the title 
of my, my talk here tonight is, one is the loneliest number. Now, how does that relate to biblical apologetics? Thank you, Eddie, for that title. No, no way. Tonight, I'd like us to conduct a thought experiment, thinking through the idea of reality in terms of two choices. These two choices are not two sides of the same coin or two opposite forces like yin and yang that are inter interdependent. These two perspectives are diametrically opposed and are therefore irreconcilable. As Peter Jones puts it in his book, The Other Worldview, the question is simple. Is reality one or is it two? Why is one or oneism not only the loneliest number, but a false number as a worldview that stands in direct opposition to the biblical worldview of two or twoism? So I'd like us to think about that tonight. So let's uh, take a moment to define these terms of oneism and twoism. It's kind of strange. They're uh, they're made-up words by Peter Jones, but hopefully they'll help, they'll help us tonight understand the New Age perspective. In essence, oneism is a core set of control beliefs or worldview that shapes, that worships the created order. Man is inherently divine as is material reality. The ultimate purpose of one's individual self-actualization through self-discovery is unity with the cosmos. The universe, which includes man, is all that exists. All is one, and one is all. So twoism, in contrast to oneism, refers to a binary worldview with a clear distinction between the creator and the, cre and the creature, where God is the center of one's worship and devotion. God is the measure of all things, not man, and not the universe. And as Peter Jones sums it up, if God and nature make up reality, then all is two, and all is creature or creator. If the universe is all there is, there's only one. So a little bit of a autobiographical background here. My interest in comparative religions and worldviews dates back to the 70s. I received a master's degree in religious studies from UCSB with an emphasis on Chinese and Japanese Buddhism, so all of these authors that you cited are very familiar with to me, Dr. Eddie. Now, I started meditating in a Zen Buddhist temple in Redondo Beach about three nights a week. I was attracted to Zen during this intense period of self-discovery because it struck me as the most authentic form of Buddhism. It was simple, it was direct, and it required rigorous discipline, which, attract, which I was attracted to. So the protocol for the study of Zen is as follows. The Zen master gives you a koan, which is a, a question for you to meditate on. And through this process of meditating on this koan, you have a breakthrough or a moment of insight, hopefully, if you work hard enough at it, which is called satori, or enlightenment. So one example of a koan is, you know the sound of two hands clapping. What is the sound of one hand clapping? All right. So according to Zen, any answer from a purely rational perspective totally misses the mark. There's a mind-to-mind -mind transmission from the Zen master to the student that is intuitive, and it's a truth beyond words and letters. Therefore, any attempt to capture the essence of truth through propositional statements misses the mark completely. Zen claims that upon enlightenment, one is able to see reality in its thusness or suchness, reality as it clearly is. You see yourself, and you see reality as it is. The subject-object distinction is gone. All there is is moment-to-moment -moment reality. One discovers his true self, and one is truly one with the cosmos. This is oneism. So I'm going to read now from a a Zen master, a Soto Zen master, will give you a little flavor for what their perspective is. Quote, a cherished ancient image of the mind in Zazen is a clear mirror, boundless, extending everywhere. This mirror holds within and displays whatever comes, accepting all without preference or rejection, both the beautiful and the ugly, the welcome and the unwelcome, 
scenes of war and peace, friends and enemies, moments of life and death, the whole world all embraced and enveloped by the mirror without resistance or judgment in thorough peace and equanimity. The mirror does not prefer sweet over sour, sunshine over rain, here instead of there. Even our stormy emotions are shown in the mirror as just passing images, moments of fear, sadness, loss, and longing. So the idea about Zen, your mind is a mirror. You have to clean the mirror through meditation, and therefore you will see reality as it is. So several months into my Zen study, I decided to attend a session which is a week-long intensive retreat at a Zen monastery where monks and laymen meditate several hours a day. The morning of the second day, I realized I was never going to get there. So I got my VW van or my VW uh, square back with the plastic seats and putt-putted back down the hill from Mount Baldy. And I have to admit, I was, a, I was, a, I was relieved and yet I was a bit sad that I I, I, I had failed the test, but by God's providence, I would add, I failed the test. I applied after that to the History of Consciousness program at UC Santa Cruz, headed up by Norman O. Brown, who is a colleague of Herbert Marcuse, who is a fully committed neo-Marxist and one of the founders of critical theory. In hindsight, God had my back, as my application to the program was not accepted. Who knows where I would have ended up. So, what does Zen and Buddhism have to do with one-ism and the explosion of New Age philosophy and the resurgence of paganism we're confronted with today? So when you walk into a grocery store and you see shelves full of Zen water being sold, you know something's up here. <laughs> or the Americanized version of it. In 2014, there were 724 trademarks featuring the word Zen. The 60s, with the age of openness to East Asian philosophy, the Beatles, George Harrison, Maharashi, Mahesh Yogi, I think I butchered that name, the Beat Generation, saw the infusion of certain characteristics of Zen that really meshed well with postmodernism and New Age spirituality. And the end result was this confusing potpourri of spirituality and ideas. The end result was this confusion, and which is what we have today. So Zen's emphasis on intuitive insight and ultimate truth being non-rational, in essence, blended perfectly with the counterculture of the 60s. So the list of New Age oneist ideologies is extensive. Spiritualism, New Thought, Shamanism, Theosophy, Animism, Transcendentalism, Modern Paganism, Modern Buddhism, Druidry, Wicca, Esotericism, the list goes on and on. I find it difficult to basically identify specific precepts of the New Age. One is spirituality, since the concepts and ideas, they don't always hang together, as Dr. Eddy pointed out, in a coherent worldview. But that being said, I'd say there were six main aspects of New Age spirituality. Number one, belief in reincarnation and the law of karma. Number two, belief in astrology. Number three, faith in psychics to be able to commune with the dead. Number four, belief that physical objects have spiritual energy. Number five, Belief that mind can champion over matter, that a person's intention, if strong enough, can actually change external reality. And number six, belief that personal redemption is possible through personal focus and individual effort combined with right thinking and clear intention. Not only has Zen, Oneism, New Age philosophy permeated Western culture at large, it's infiltrated the Christian church. A study by the Pew Research Group in 2018 found that 47% of evangelical Protestants believe in at least one of these six ideas. I wonder if our evangelical brothers and sisters in this category have read the first chapter of Romans. So let's take a look at a, a couple of figures that have had a major impact on the meteoric rise of these New Age ideas. The first one is Carl Jung, who's a Swiss psychologist who had originally studied 
under Sigmund Freud, and I was very enamored with uh, Jungian psychology in my studies up at UCSB. Um, he has some really interesting but um, pretty far out theories. Jung and Freud had a collaborative relationship for several years. However, they parted ways over Jung's bent for the mystical, spiritual aspect of humans that Freud, with his sole emphasis on human sexuality as the driving force behind our behavior, Freud denied it, any kind of mystical or spiritual entity. So central to Jung's ideology was the idea of the collective unconscious, which is represented as a segment of the deepest unconscious mind that is genetically inherited and not shaped by personal experience. So Jung argued that human beings are connected to each other and their ancestors through this shared set of ideas and experiences that fundamentally link the entirety of humanity throughout history. This repository of the collective unconscious contained what Jung called archetypes. These were universal, inborn models of people, behaviors, and personalities that play a major role in influencing our behavior. So basing his theory on observations of his patients' dreams, which had overlapping archetypes and similar archetypes that were impinging on their conscious reality and causing them issues, Jung contended that these archetypes were present in the art, the traditions of all cultures, in the history of the human race, and these archetypes were, in a sense, universals. They're what linked us together. So some examples of archetypes in ancient literature were, would include the ruler, the sage, the artist, the rebel, the explorer, the apocalypse, the deluge, the creation. And as symbols, water would represent life and rebirth. The, cycle, the uh, circle represents unity and wholeness. And the number three symbolizes light and spiritual awareness. So for Jung, the spiritual person looked inward. He focused on dreams and archetypal images in those dreams and the elements of history and culture that linked human experience throughout the ages as one. So through this process, Jung claimed that we could discover the blueprints of our souls or our spiritual DNA. Reality was one in that there was no creator or providential God ruling over the cosmos. There was one reality of a true self that lay deep under the layers of one's psyche, and through meditation on archetypes, one could unlock the key to self-discovery, which Jung called individuation. That's the integration of the collective unconscious into one's conscious life. So this was the task of the authentic individual, self-realization through this introspective process. Now, this is fascinating. Jung was trying to develop the world's worst, the world's first unitary religion. Now, think of the album cover, Dark Side of the Moon. Some of you remember that album, right? You have a, a beam of pure light that passes through a prism, and on the other side of the prism, the light splits off into primary colors, right? The light of truth passes through this prism of culture and is divided into different religions or interpretations of reality based on cultural filters. So according to Jung, our goal should be to get back to the other side of the prism, the pure light. Reality is ultimately one. So Peter Jones cites Jung as the real founder of the New Age movement. As Jung sought to deconstruct classical biblical religion and Christianity's in insistence on a binding authority to a sovereign creator God. Jung reinterpreted the Christian view of God via Hindu pantheism and self-realization. Jung insisted that we needed the courage to sin. Reality was one, so good and evil need each other and are coexistent like the yin and yang symbol. Opposites meld into one. Any observance of normal boundaries becomes repressive, so unlimited sex becomes a human right. Sound familiar? Jung's determined effort to undermine binary facts and life-affirming principles succeeded in laying the foundation for the New Age movement. In Jungian terms, the true spiritual person was a shaman who had the courage to convene with the spirits and the dark side of human nature, the shadow side of the psyche. Now, I don't know if you ever read the teachings of Don Juan. Um, 
You probably haven't. <laughs> I did during my day. And, and if you think of it, uh, there's a shaman in there which is taking peyote, and a lizard appears on his shoulder and is whispering words of wisdom in the shaman's ear. In commenting on Young's influence on Western thought and culture, Peter Jones states, Young exploded the foundations of the long-standing edifice of Western biblical twoism, working to rebuild humanity based on working to rebuild edifice of Western biblical twoism, working to rebuild humanity based on religious oneism. So let's now take a look at a more modern prophet of New Age philosophy and spirituality. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of Wayne Dyer. Dr. Eddie mentioned him. He's on the PBS shows. Um, seems like a nice guy. You know, he's uh, pleasant. And when you watch the uh, folks that are watching him, they, they seem very um, taken in by his uh, persona and what he has to say. Well, I happened to watch a uh, show called The Forever Wisdom of Wayne Dyer. And Mr. Dyer quotes from several ancient traditions and literature, including the Bible, to formulate his own brand of spiritual but not religious ideology. So I just want to share some of these quotes with you. To quote Mr. Dyer, there are no mistakes in the universe. The only mistakes we, ha we have are ideas that we are separate from the perfection from which we were created. Hmm. When you change the way you look at things, the things you look at will change. In the universe, there is an, an immeasurable and indescribable force which those of the source call intention. Everything that exists in the entire cosmos is attached to intention by a connecting link. Uh, if you're having a hard time following this, um, I am as well. Within all of us is a divine capacity to manifest and attract all that we need and desire. Heaven is a state of mind and not a location, since spirit is everywhere and in everything. The state of your life is nothing more than a reflection of your state of mind. And finally, the only limits you have are the limits you believe. So the source, according to Mr. Dyer, is a field of energy tapped into by one's clear intention. You can call it God, you can call it Tao, Buddha, Vishnu, Shiva, Brahma, real spirituality emanates from the effort by the individual to link oneself to this impersonal force through purified intention. And if there's anything lacking, the fault's with us and our failure to refine our ability to link ourselves with the universal force. The universe will answer all things if you connect with the universal intention. Now, how many times have you heard someone say, well, I don't know what to do, but I'm going to put what I want out to the universe and the universe will answer. As a participant in Life Spring in my early 30s, which was an offshoot of S, this is exactly what was taught. It was all about clear intention, manifesting one's own being into the universe, and if you had clear intention, circumstances would change and mind would triumph over matter. At this point, if you're a bit confused, don't worry. New Age, one is philosophy and spirituality is a strange brew of ideas and concepts. And when brought to the bar of intellectual scrutiny, these ideas really do not hold together. But this would feed into the oneness argument that the truth is to be intuited. It's non-rational and is beyond words and letters. Truth is completely subjective. So now that we've had a look at the two of the uh, great prophets of the New Age Oneness Framework. Let's uh, take a look and try to dissect and discern some fundamental differences between the Oneist and the Twoist worldviews. So, in Oneism, there is no creator. The universe is self-created or eternal. Something is created out of nothing. In Twoism, creation ex nihilo by an omnipotent omnipotent God, God creates something out of nothing. In oneism, God is within oneself and nature. Everything is divine. In twoism, man is created by God and is not God. In oneism, man has the capacity to redeem himself through self-discovery. In twoism, man has fallen and cannot 
redeem himself. He is dead in his sins. In one-ism, events are determined by karma. Consequences of one's own, own actions reverberate throughout time. In twoism, God's providence upholds, directs, disposes, and governs all. In one-ism, good and evil are reconciled as mutually dependent. One cannot exist without the other. In twoism, God is absolutely and perfectly good in himself. Goodness is part of and emanates from God's holy character. In one-ism, all religions are true. In twoism, there is only one religion and all, the, all others are false. In one-ism, self-discovery, expressive, indi in, expressive individualism, and utopia are the ultimate goals. In twoism, glorifying God and enjoying him forever is the goal. In one-ism, there's a rejection of any and all kind of binding authority. We are aut autonomous beings completely. In twoism, submission, we submit to binding authority of a sovereign God. In oneism, there's an elimination of binary structures, and again, distinctions are flattened. In twoism, there's an adherence to and a celebration of binary structures and distinctions. In oneism, there's no cost. Truth is based on what one feels at any moment in time. In twoism, we know that we need to count the cost. In oneism, the shaman is the true spiritual person who convenes with the spirit world, and in twoism, the saint who is in Christ is a true spiritual person. In oneism, spiritual but not religious is a superior perspective, and in twoism, True spirituality without binding authority is impossible. And lastly, one-ism, relativism results in moral confusion. And two-ism, moral absolutes result in moral clarity. So as I wrap things up here, let's uh, take a look at evaluating these different systems of fundamental core beliefs based on four questions. Number one, why is there something rather than nothing? Number two, why are things the way they are? Why do we suffer in the world? Number three, is there any hope for redemption or rescue from this unsatisfactory human condition? And number four, how will the end play out in history? So in one-ism, the universe is eternal. There is no ultimate purpose to reality except for us as evolved beings to continue to realize ourselves, build a utopia, and make the world a better place. There really isn't a specific answer as to why there is something rather than nothing. There is for his own glory because he is God. Why are things the way they are? Why do we suffer? One is them. Well, there's a couple of answers. Um, Mr. Dwyer would say that things are actually perfect, but because of our lack of clear intention, things are not as they should be. This is in our grasp, however, with self-discovery and clear intention. Buddhism would claim that the unsatisfactory lot of humanity is due to karma in our continuing of bad deeds that perpetuate this cycle of birth and death. In twoism, in biblical Christianity, the fall. The fall is why things are not the way they should be. Man fell into sin. The world is under a curse. The cosmos is groaning. And this would seem to line up with our experience of, what the world, of, of the world as it is in terms of what Dr. Eddy talked about, the correspondence theory of reality. Number three, is there any hope for redemption or rescue from this unsatisfactory human condition? One ism would say hope for redemption is striving for utopia based on the making of the world of a better place through self-discovery, self-actualization, and the individuation of human beings who are authentic or creating more good karma. Twoism, hope is found in the alien righteousness of Christ's work imputed to our account through the instrument of faith. Question number four, well, how will the end play out in history? In oneism, it's a cyclical view of history. In Buddhist eschatology, there's aeons and aeons of time, millions and millions and millions of years that keep recycling like Nietzsche's eternal recurrence. And the only way out is through the accumulation of enough good karma or becoming enlightened, 
whereby one escapes the realm of birth and death, but this could take thousands of lifetimes if, if you're able to do it at all. In Tuism, biblical Christianity, history is linear. It has a beginning, a middle, and an end. So what do you think? Is reality one or two? Why is one such a lonely number when it comes to thinking about the true nature of things? It seems like a strange way to frame the question. However, as Christians, we believe our eternal destiny resides in how we answer. Are we one with the universe? Is that the goal? Or is it by faith in Christ to love, obey, and serve God, who is our creator? The conversations we have with our friends and family who are invested emotionally in the oneist ideology, there's tough, difficult discussions. Lynn and I have had them. I'm sure we've all had them. I find that there is an intense emotional investment when beliefs in the oneist worldview are challenged. The truth is religions are not one, and all religions do not lead to the same destination. My hope is that by better understanding the contemporary oneist, pagan, zenist ideology, that we can, with respect, ask the right questions and get our friends thinking about what they believe so that on that final day, we and they are in right standing with God through faith in Christ. Boy, I just had a flashback. 1971, Don Juan, the teachings of Don Juan, a yucky way of life, Carlos Castaneda. Yeah. I'm glad I forgot it. <laughs> Some good came from all those drugs. And for our final presentation tonight, <clears throat> we have Trinitarian apologetics, loving and defending the God who is. And uh, Daniel Adrian <clears throat> was blessed to grow up in a Christian household and is also a native of Southern uh, California. Daniel says that our triune Lord graciously brought him back from wandering outside the faith at the age of 18. He has most recently studied at Fuller Theological Seminary, taking classes at the Orange County campus, along with uh, studying the Bible and Pres Presbyterian and Reformed theology as a member uh, serving as a deacon here at the Branch of Hope Orthodox Presbyterian Church. He also studies online uh, from various other institutions. So with that, uh, I would like to ask my good friend and fellow deacon, Daniel Adrian, to come forward. These are all for show. No. Uh, first, let me say thank you so much for having me. Thank you for the profound honor and blessing to speak at this conference. Thank you for all attending. And thank you for my two ruling elders for setting the stage so well for us. I'd like to begin by kind of working with a Christian definition of atheism. So in Christianity, we'll use a much broader, we'll apply atheism to a much broader set of people. And by atheism, we're looking at unbelief, a heart of unbelief of the true God. So anyone who's an unbeliever is an atheist. You'll see why this is relevant, hopefully, in just a little bit. But we apply that to anti-Trinitarians, non-Trinitarians, so people who would be considered, I don't know, by Pew Research, <laughs> as Christians or evangelicals, we would consider them atheistic as to their beliefs about the one true God. So the one true God is, of course, eternally existing in three persons. So we talk about monotheism, and much like we talk about theism, the only true theism is biblically Christian, Trinitarian, monotheism. So the only true theism is biblically Christian, Trinitarian, monotheism. So in the same sense that I would say all other theisms are no theisms, ah, theisms, 
I would say that all other monotheisms are pseudo-monotheisms. They don't actually have a one God because there's only one true and living God. So in the case of apologetics, when we're defending the faith, we can only defend the faith that that one true and living God, eternally existing in three persons, has revealed. He didn't reveal a non-Trinitarian God, not in the Old Testament, not in the New Testament. The, the, church, the Christian church, the confessing biblical Christian church, has never confessed a non-Trinitarian God. Now, has our Trinitarian theology always been what it should be? No, of course not. Uh, is, there a, is there a much further and greater clarity of and of understanding given to us in the New Testament of the Trinity and what we are to believe about him and who he is in his three persons? Yes. Yes, it's much clearer. But did Old Testament saints have faith in a non-existent God which saved them? No. So whatever their Trinitarian theology was, however developed it was, it was true, it was living, it was a saving faith. Whatever Trinitarian theology, the, the least schooled among us, if there's a faith the size of, a, the, of a, the seed of a mustard seed, the mustard seed, the seed of a mustard tree plant, whatever that thing is, the seed of the mustard plant, biblical imagery, right? If it's that small, that's a Trinitarian faith. So what we've always confessed as Reformed and Presbyterian believers is that the Trinity is actually an article of faith that's foundational and fundamental. Some of us remember the fighting fundamentalists. Some of us remember the five fundamentals, and then there were seven, and so on and so forth. But when I speak of fundamental, it's of the essence of what we believe, to believe in God, one God, and three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So with that, let me briefly remark on how well the, the stage was set by my my ruling elder brethren here. Um, I think we, we see that, how many here are familiar with cafeteria Christianity? Cafeteria Christianity. Yep, some people in the room, yeah. So it's this idea that, you, that Christianity is this cafeteria. It has a lot of dishes. And you, just like going to a, or a buffet style Christianity, and you go in and you eat and savor the dishes that you like. But what we saw in looking at the, the ideas of the world, what was summarized for us briefly, is what you see in many people who would identify themselves as having some form of spirituality, some form of religious commitment, though they might shy away from that word. So they have a cafeteria style, a buffet style atheism. They pick and choose maybe thoughts from Jung, as we talked about, maybe thoughts from Freud, maybe, maybe Wayne Dyer, and they'd have never even seen a PBS publicly funded, by the way, Wayne Dyer presentation. So they take what they want from these various thinkers and they make a God and a worldview of their own imagination. That's what they do. So they make their own gods. And this is the concept of idolatry that we see very early, not only in the world, but in Israel, in the church, in the Old Testament, is this idea of making your own gods. Now, it's very literal in some cases, in many cases throughout the Old Testament, right? It's making a god of wood or of stone or of brass or of gold and, and fashioning it. And of course, we would all say, well, that's preposterous. But we can intellectually make an idol that is not the true god. And then we've transitioned into atheism. So if we are confessing the god who is not, which is any god who's other than one god, three persons, then we've lapsed into idolatry as well. So we've broken the first commandment by not believing in the true God and thereby necessarily putting something above him. And we've broken the second commandment by not worshiping him as he has authorized and commanded, but rather making a graven image, even if it's a graven image in our mind. So intellectually, inside, spiritually, we want to confess the true God. And of course, among ourselves, we want to confess the true God, right? We want to talk about the true God to one another. We want to speak of him. We want to worship him and praise him. And of course, when we're, one of the things that I've talked about in this church for years now is, and on the radio, on apologetics.com, quick plug for the radio show, uh, is apologetics as a form of pre-evangelism, clearing away of objections so you can present the gospel. So in doing Trinitarian apologetics, in showing them the God who is, Many of you, without maybe thinking about it specifically that way, that's what you were doing. You weren't. The idea is a 
some people refer to it as blank theism. It's sort of this notion of God that is formless, contentless, doesn't really have any specificity, right? It's just some, yeah, he's God, he's creator, he's all powerful. Maybe they have some of the attributes and that's all they have. That's not what we defend. But did you realize in those cases where you have defended the Trinity that you were defending the Trinity, that you were defending God as triune, three in one? When you evangelized, did you realize you were evangelizing, you were giving the gospel of that same triune Lord? And then how many of us realize that actually every work outside of the Trinity, all three persons are involved in? It's a common work of the Trinity. Now inside, that's where we get to personal properties, eternal relations of origin, that's where, and that's where the scripture is largely silent. So when I say biblically Trinitarian, there's a history in the church, not a good one this time, of while we're trying to refine it, sometimes we can be overly speculative. We can pry into things that are not revealed in scripture. And of course, those things belong to the Lord. The secret things belong to the Lord, but that which he has revealed belongs to generation after generation. Loose paraphrase of Deuteronomy 29, 29. So the secret things we don't get to pry into. The, the, the inside-ness of God that he hasn't revealed, that's where we can become overly speculative. And you'll see this if you study this issue. And what our Reformed and Presbyterian forefathers and forebears did well is saying, yeah, let's shy away from that and let's look explicitly and really exclusively, in, in a sense, but certainly primarily, at what God says about himself in the Bible. So that's the hope for the talk as we move forward. Um, like I said, it was very well set up for me in the sense that we talked about truth and different various views of truth. Hopefully coming to your mind would be Jesus himself confessing that he's the way, the truth, and the life. And hopefully some of you know, if you've spoken with me about this, is one of the things I try to convey regularly, or if you've heard some of us talk about this on the radio. We talk about truth as eternal, right? There's, if something is true, it didn't begin to be true, and that truth content of that thing is not going to become something else in the future, right? That's what we mean by eternal, the eternality of truth. But we also know that Jesus himself is the truth, and of course that would apply to the Father and the Spirit. Not one, not three truths, but one truth. And you'll hear me repeatedly talk about not one this or not three this, but rather the other, because this is how we guard against the two errors, errors that are so prevalent in the church. On the one hand, you tend towards fake monotheism, a monotheism that gets rid of the real, actual, rational, and metaphysically true distinction of the person. The ultimate reality of God is that he has always existed in three persons. So if we go too far in this direction, then it seems like the sun began to exist. This should sound familiar to some of you. It's heretical. That the spirit began to exist, also heretical. And what's interesting about even Kabbalists, people who study the Kabbalah, is some of them have a trinity from the Old Testament, just to connect earlier with what I was saying about an Old Testament Trinitarian theology. Uh, some of the ancient Greeks have Trinitarian and triadic formulations. This is not to say that they learned these things from nature. This is to say that they had contact with believing Jews and were influenced by them. Plato's trip to Egypt would be a potential source. That was believed and confessed by some of our theologians. That's where he got a tritheistic knowledge, a tritheistic notion of what he called the good, which was his God and the one, which we'll get to with that as well. So in, as I begin in talking about the essence of God, the substance of God, and I'll try to stick with the substance of God because that's the language we use in Western churches. What we're talking about there is the godness of God, the deity of God, the Godhead, the divinity. That's, that's the oneness. This is why we don't, we're not tritheistic, which is the other error that we're guarding against. That would be three gods. So how do, we, how do we square that circle? Well, it's not squaring a circle, right? Because the only way this would be a contradiction would be to say that there are three substances and three persons. At the same time, 
in the same relation in the same place. Or, or alternative, alternatively, we would say there's one person who is equal to the one essence. And those things contradict. Now, I, I would hope everyone here knows what it means for God to be personal. And this was touched on, I think, in both talks, actually. So we know that God is personal. He reveals himself. He's communicative. He talks. He, he speaks to himself, which is some of the verses we're going to look at. These are all proper to a person. So if the Father speaks to the Son, and the Spirit speaks to anyone else, including the Father or the Son, then we have already gone a long way in seeing the distinction between the persons and establishing that it's not a unipersonality, which we would just call personality of God, but a tri-personality of God. That's the way in which the one God, the Godhead, exists. So he eternally exists as Father, Son, and Spirit. I'm going to try to stick to persons, but you'll see why other more technical theological accounts prefer subsistence, subsistence for the persons. And all that's pointing to is that this is the way that the one substance exists in three persons. I'm going to stop these hand motions. People will quickly accuse me of trying to analogize the Trinity. I better guard against that. But... <laughs> But the eternal, so there's all sorts of terms here. I'm going to try to minimize the need for those. But it's the way in which God exists in himself. That's how, that's what we're talking about. That's why we, that's why there is no contradiction. That's why that, although certainly these things are too high and too majestic for us, they're past finding out, they're unsearchable, these truths, they are not beyond reason in the sense of unreasonable. God is the source of reason. God made you a rational soul and gave you a body. But he made you a rational soul. So these things are to be understood, but the limitation is we can't reason from, <laughs> hopefully this won't offend anyone, <laughs> uh, a shamrock or water, the modes of water, to the Trinity. Why can't we do that? That's actually modalism. Both of those are forms of saying that God existed in different modes throughout his eternal life. So there's a time when he's the father and then he shifts modes to being the son and then he shifts modes to being the spirit. Classical dispensationalism actually sort of tends towards modalism. Now, all of these errors we see in the church, if I tell you, you have a bad theology of the Bible, obviously there are gonna be problems in the church. And we know that that's happened historically. We've seen, and we've seen the problems. But how many of us are really close to people who deny the inerrancy, the perfection, the authority, the infallibility of scriptures? Some of us are, but not many of us. I would encourage you to find those people and befriend them and correct them on this. Jesus was nothing if he wasn't a great corrector of theology in his earthly ministry. He was correcting people's theology every time he taught. So you would find those people, and out of love, you would show them that, indeed, no, the scriptures are perfect, they're from God, they're God's word, they're sufficient, all the other attributes I said. And you'll notice that those attributes reflect God's attributes in himself, his perfections. So he identifies himself with his word. Okay, so, but where do we see these problems coming into the church? Let's, let, maybe, maybe we're talking about People who say, yeah, the Bible, the Bible, the Bible, and the Bible's the word of God. The Bible's the word of God alone. Great, even better. Where do we see them coming into the church? Most often where you see them coming to the church and is, what's called, is in what's called theology proper. So it's the understanding of God's substance and his persons, his trinity and his unity. That's where you see these problems coming into the church. And so you'll hear people who say, really hard to stomach things about the threeness of God and really hard to stomach things about the oneness of God. And they mean well. This is difficult. This is not easy. I'm, I, I, I tremble. I'm fearful and, and reverent in speaking about the Trinity because the Trinity is, is so high and unsearchable. The, the classical historical language of the church is it's, it's the chief mystery the highest mystery of the Christian faith. And again, mystery used the way they used it back then, not the way it's been 
perverted today, which is this paradox and contradiction and that would militate against all those things I said earlier about, no, the Trinity is to be understand, understood. But when you use your reason, you use your reason applying it to what he's revealed about himself in his word. Now, you'll, hear, you'll notice I use he, 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 him, 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 always in prayer, Lord willing, he and him. When, if you hear ever they or there, that's only when I'm talking about those eternal relations of origin. And we'll get to that in the second part. But... Deuteronomy 6.4 is going to establish for you, this is the Shema, this is a, a bedrock principle of the Bible. This is confessed by the people of God, the covenant people of God, who is under the ruling and sovereign hand of the covenant triune Lord throughout the Old Testament. And over and over and over, their confession of faith, faith <laughs> their confession of faith is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord, all caps, because that's Jehovah, his covenantal name. That's the name that we're going to get to. The Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thine soul and with all thy might. So you hear the greatest commandment. Love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thine soul, and with all thy strength, with all thy might. The greatest commandment is linked to the oneness of God. Generally, when you talk to Christians, they don't have a problem with the oneness of God. Now, today, historically, it was a big problem. <laughs> but, but right now, it's the threeness of God where we see a lot of problems. The other thing I want to talk about, well, there's a couple other verses I want to look at specifically before we go into further detail. 1 Corinthians 8, verses 4 through 6. As concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols... We know that an idol is nothing in the world, and that there is none other God but one. For though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be gods many and lords many, but to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. So already, if you take Deuteronomy the way that fake monotheists take it, you can't confess what's being taught in 1 Corinthians 8 because there's a direct equivalency between what you're saying about God and most people think when they read God, it's the Father. And sometimes when you read your Bible, it is the Father. But I would say more often in my studies, God is referring to all three persons simultaneously. The context will establish this. You'll read, you know, the Father is speaking, and he'll only be called God. No problem with that, right? Because there is an order in number in the Trinity, not an order in prior, not an order in priority is the old word, but not an order of superiority. What's that numbering? Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Why? Eternal relations of origin, which we'll get to. The personal properties of the deity. So, why is this such a problem in this verse? And by the way, God's many and Lord's many. So God's rulers, rulers many, they were called gods. You see this in the Psalms, gods in heaven, gods on earth. But there's only one God. Think of the first commandment. No other gods before me. So my absolute ruler, my absolute sovereign is God. And yeah, of course, he's the only God that exists. Hence the God who is. Well, let's further make this a problem for people who would try to overemphasize the oneness of God. John 10, verses 30 and 31. And you'll see the Jewish reaction. The Jews knew what a big problem this was. I and my father are one. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Again, notice, they were going to stone him before. They knew he was saying he's God. That he's one with the divine substance. That's why they were going to kill him. They were going to kill him extrajudicially, outside of legal process, biblical legal process, for confessing that he is the one God. So put those all together and you see why we have to move immediately into discussing the three persons. So John 14, verses 16 through 17. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. 
So here we see actually one of these relations of origin, which I may as well talk about now. So the Father and the Son send the Spirit eternally. There was never a time in which the Father and the Son together did not send the Spirit. All of these relations of origin are historically known as processions. Why is that confusing? Because people think of proceeding as really being proper only to the Spirit. But the way that the Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son is by this sending. So the Father sends the Son. The Father sends the Son, yes. The Father sends the Spirit, and the Spirit is sent by the Son together. This is what created the great separation between the East and the West. The East still will not confess this. We can talk about, in Q&A if you like, why that's such a big problem. I can even give you something that could reunite us if the Spirit blessed it. So, heavy stuff. We needed this comforter, and it's better for us that we have this comforter. So the sending of the Spirit, the pouring out of the Spirit in time. But this is, re this is referring back to the eternal sending of the Spirit by the Father and the Son as well. Because it's proper to the... If the Father sent the Holy Ghost from the beginning, which he did, then how could the Son take the Holy Ghost from the Father and then send him in time? This would be a huge issue. That's the, that's the understanding of... That's the understanding of this text by the Eastern Orthodox. That's a bad understanding because that, mean, that means a real change in God. You've, you've lost immutability. So this is why we have to discard that change. It's not that Jesus now has this new thing where he sends out the eternal spirit. Of course, the eternal spirit has always proceeded from the eternal father and the eternal son together. That's one eternal relation of origin. The others, a lot easier for most people to get a, gra a grasp of. The Son is eternally begotten, that's the way of proceeding, eternally begotten by the Father. That's why he's eternally the Son. There was never a time in which the second person of the Trinity was not the Son. He did not begin to become the Son. He's always been, always is, and always will be the Son. So therefore, the third, moving in reverse order, 3, 2, 1, relation of origin, eternal relation of origin. The Father, the Father has always been the Father. Because the Father has always been eternally begetting the Son. That is the way of pro procession from the Father. Also note, you know, some of you will probably already realize this, logically that means that the Father proceeds from none. He does not proceed from the Son, and he does not proceed from the Spirit. This is the eternal relationship of the Trinity in himself, of God, the Godhead in himself. This is what makes the Father the Father, the Son the Son, and the Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit. Notice, nothing there implies any subordination, fancy word for any lowering in rank of either of the second, either the second or the third person of the Trinity. It doesn't say that because the Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son, he's somehow less than. No, because of course God is one God. He's co-equal, he's co-eternal. He's co-essential, which means consubstantial. He shares one substance, one essence. So there, there is no subordination, there is no lowering of eminence or of perfection in the eternal relations of origin and the three personal properties that make up the Trinity. If that were true, then you wouldn't just have three different gods, you'd have a hierarchy of gods. You'd have God, the greatest God, then you'd have like God Jr. I mean, this is blasphemy, I'm not, this is what the people believe, and then you'd have, whoa, God who's really down the totem pole, which is the Holy Spirit. This is why you have such a defective view of the Holy Spirit in so many professing Christian churches. He's the forgotten God. That was literally a book written, sold millions of copies. It was about the third person of the Trinity, Holy Ghost. So that gives you a tritheism of lesser gods, which of course, if God is God, then he's eternally the same. That's what it means to be eternal. We establish that with truth. And therefore, of course, he can't be getting better. He's not in, Hegel was mentioned. This is, <laughs> Hegel's view of God is God is realizing himself through history. God is changing and becoming more God. And the apex of this was, of course, Christianity because Hegel probably didn't want to deal with the civil magistrate. He didn't want to have the, the Christian magistrate knocking on his door and say, whoa, 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 you say something better than Christianity is coming? We have a problem with that. This is Hegel's view. Well, you see a changing God in a bunch of the views that we examined earlier in the first two talks. You see a changing God, God forbid, in the church. 
You hear a changing God taught. You hear a changing God written. You hear, you read a changing God written about. If you really want to know the kind of work that we need to do as apologists, as theologians, because everyone in this room is an apologist and a theologian, search the stuff on the Trinity. Just Google the Trinity. Most of it is not only heretical, it's blasphemous. The top results are there's no trinity, trinity's ra rationalism, uh, horrible things are said. Servetus, who died in Geneva by the civil magistrate, was beheaded because Calvin said, behead him, it's more merciful than to burn him at the stake. He wrote a book calling the trinity a three-headed monster. That's why he was put to death, among many other blasphemous things that he did, and he stirred up trouble wherever he went. That's why he was executed, not because Calvin was this mean, bad guy. Calvin had his flaws. I think there are more biblical ways to execute people than beheading, but that's neither here nor there. <laughs> John 14, verses 18 through 19. I will come to you yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more, but ye see me because I live. Ye shall live also. At that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. Okay, I and my Father are one. He's not going to become in the Father in a different sense, but we're going to be in him such that we are taken up into the Trinity as to fellowship. We don't become members of the Trinity. The human nature did not become a member of the Trinity. Because that, if you confess that God, that God the Son is two persons, then that would mean that the, the second person, the human person, would have to be brought up into the Trinity, and then you'd have four persons. This is why we have to guard so clearly against the human nature constituting a second person. Yes, he's fully God and fully man, but he's not two persons. He's one person, the eternal second person of the Trinity. That's why that's so critical. We can talk about that in Q&A as well, if you wish. Matthew 3, verses 16 through 17. So this is, uh, this is the foundation of our baptism. This is where our baptism comes from. And notice, this is... This is the, when we're baptized, we're brought into the church. So who brings us into the church? Well, of course, God. So note who's here. Just as I made passing reference to God being all through the Old Testament, God the Father, the Son, and the Spirit being all through the Old Testament, and how he's in creation, and John 1 confirms this. Well, a further confirmation of these Trinitarian works of God outside of himself would be the baptism of Jesus. Hear now the word of the Lord. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water. And lo, the heavens were opened unto him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. This is God speaking to himself. This is God interacting with himself. Of course, he did, he's done that from eternity past. So when people stress the relationality of God, this is what I hope they're meaning. But if you make God into a social trinity, now he's a community. A community is multiple members. Now God has parts. What do we know about com composition? Anything that is composed has a composer. God is the composer of all things and therefore has no composition. There are no parts in God. Very key that we know this and confess this. The trinity is not three parts of God. God is one divided whole essence. And the Father is equally that, the Son is equally that, and the Spirit is equally that. That's what it means for him to eternally have one Godhead, one substance, one deity. So there's a lot of great verses that go on to see, say these things further. But let's talk about the Father. Uh, Ephesians 1, 3. Thank you. Because how much time do I have? <laughs> I want to be mindful of my time. Nice. Get, get him. <laughs> I didn't say that. I'll take him up. No, I'm just <laughs> Ephesians 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Okay, well, proper to God is worship, adoration, the names of God, blessing, the blessedness of God. He's eternally blessed. He can't bless. I mean, angels can't bless you. Saints can't bless you. No one can bless you apart from God. When we bless each other, it's because God caused us to bless one another. Right? God is the first cause. So you can be a blessing to one another, and I hope you are. I hope this is a blessing to you. But it's ultimately God who's blessing us. And the source of blessedness here 
is the father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, how would it, how blasphemous would it be if, if the father alone is Lord to say he's the father of our Lord Jesus Christ? This is why confessing a lower view of the son is a non-starter. It's a non-starter in the Old Testament, but it gets exceptionally clear in the New Testament. You just can't do it, especially when it's the Lord says to my Lord. So Jehovah says to Jehovah. Yeah, we're not going to be able to go down that road. But as I said, I mean, if you, if you read systematic theologies, you'll find that they don't even talk about the personality of the Father, the personhood of the Father. Do you know why? Because no one was fighting about that. Everybody presupposed the personality of the Father, the personhood of the Father, that God is a person. Now, later they did that for the sake of completeness, but there's a long history where that's not even covered. They go straight to the Son, straight to the Spirit, because that's where the battle is raging. Right? Even today, there are people who would deny the personality of the Spirit. How does the Spirit communicate? How did the Spirit cause a book to be written? Using the hands of men, moving them along, inspiring them. How, what force, what impersonal force could do that? Right? If, if language is given and language is used, then you have to have a language user. A language user has to be rational, has to be logical, has to think. Now. Someone might say, so there's three centers of consciousness in God. Someone has actually said this. People have written this. No, God forbid. Three centers of consciousness, the way I understand a center of consciousness, a center of awareness, would be to confess that there are three minds in God. If you have three minds in God, you have three gods. No, that's not what I'm saying. It's the shared essence, right? All the perfections, all the, the substance of God is also... In the substance of God are all of his perfections. His perfections are his attributes. They're called perfections because they're perfect. They're whole, they're complete, they're eternal. So he's eternally love, he's eternally just, he's eternally righteous, he's eternally holy. So all of these things require thinking. They require will. This is why God does not have three wills, three minds. Because it's in his essence, the shared essence, but shared wholly, undividedly, not in parts. This is why I said, and this is why I alluded to the high mystery, the most high mystery of this. It's hard. It's hard stuff. It's not easy. But it's not as hard as people make it out to be either. It's not, nothing I've said should, be, should, should have you sitting here saying, oh, that doesn't sound like it fits together. And if it does, that's on me. Because the data, the information, that which is revealed, there's no problem in it. So it might be my problem of communicating it, but there's no problem in the actual text. There's no problem in summarizing this doctrine and explaining it because this is the God we're defending. This is the God we're loving in the biblical sense of knowing. We know him intimately, we love him. This is what we do out in the world as ambassadors for Christ. This is part and parcel of our worship, our devotion, of our service, of our evangelizing, of our sharing of the truth, sharing of the law of God, not just the gospel, but of course the gospel, not only for salvation, but for sanctification, sanctification of ourselves, sanctification of our brethren, sanctification of the world, if they be sanctified by the sanctifier, the Holy Ghost. So let's look at John 1, 14 and 18. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. No man hath seen God at any time, the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. So eternally the Son rests in the bosom of the Father. This is where that eternal begetting is happening. So he's eternally the Father to the Son in his bosom, and of course the Son is eternally the son of the father in his father's bosom. And if we go to the Holy Spirit. So I think people here, hopefully, and the rest of you, we can talk about this as well, but most people here would know that the Spirit is, is given in an of the in two ways. I'm trying to avoid terms here, but... We speak of the Spirit in the Old Testament. God reveals the Spirit in the Old Testament as the Spirit of God, the Spirit of the Father, and the Spirit of who? The Spirit of Jesus, the Spirit of the Christ. 
So I'm going to, for the sake of time, I'm going to look at Galatians 4, verse 6, just to show you. And because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Okay, the spirit of his son, the Holy Spirit. That's the spirit of adoption, where in Romans, earlier, we find out, we also cry, Abba, Father. Same spirit, spirit of God, spirit of the Father, spirit of the Son. If not, then we've got potentially three more spirits. We're on the way to the misunderstanding of the sevenfold spirit in Revelation. No one, thankfully, argues that. No one says, oh, there's a spirit of the Father and a spirit of Christ, and they're two different persons. But notice, of the is... Again, it, in, in the Greek, it, it's called the genitive. We have the genitive as well. And it does speak of the proceeding from the Father and the Son, that of the. So if, if you were to clarify, like I put it in brackets because it's not, it's not as direct in the text, but this is one of the things that of the means here. It means belonging to and proceeding from. So belonging to and proceeding from the Son and belonging to and proceeding from the Father. So of the does the heavy lifting already for procession, for God and God the Father and the Son sending forth the Spirit, which we talked about. So let's do a little bit of clarification. Trinitarian definitions, please. So we've talked about the Trinity. We've talked about the eternal relations of origin, which are the personal properties, the interpersonal relations of the Trinity. We've talked about the divine essence, the divine substance. And there is a distinction between essence and substance. I'm going to stick with substance. You might hear me say essence. Don't worry about it. Um, I want you to focus on substance if you're going to pick one of those two, and you'll see why. So God is tripersonal. Talked about that, which is simply to say another way that he is triune, three and one. He is the one God in three persons. Now, I can put eternally in here a lot, and I'm going to in a later slide. He is the eternally one God in eternally three subsistence, self-existing persons. That subsistence is same substance. They all have, there's the they. They, the th persons of the Trinity, all have one substance, which is the deity, which is the Godhead, the godness of God. The old way, they actually in the 1828 Noah Webster's Dictionary, he talks about it as Godship. Don't hear that one very much anymore, do you? Next slide. Okay, Trinity. God's unity is in his substance and his diversity is in his tri-personality. Trinity and unity, unity and trinity. So the principle of diversity in God is because the, the relationship between the persons is a real relationship. It's a real relationship of difference. There are our Lutheran friends who are scholastic. They'll tell you it's not. It's only a logical or a rational distinction. Why would that be a problem? It's a tough question. But the reason why that would be a problem is because now we're, we're folding the persons into the essence, and it's becoming sort of a... And they need to do that because they need to say that the physical body of Christ can be everywhere present, and they need to do a lot of bad things for their theology to work, and this is part and parcel of what they do. We love them, we pray for them, but that's why we're not Lutherans, one of the many reasons we're not. So the next slide talks about the persons of the Godhead are, oh, we have one before that? We might not, that might be on me. Oh yeah, that's fine, we can go to substance. Or deity, deity. Deity, Godhead, divinity, the nature and essence of the supreme being, as the deity of the supreme being is manifest in his work. God, the supreme being, or infinite self-existing spirit. Hopefully that is now not too bad in what we've been talking about. You see how that ties in with the Shema, Deuteronomy 6.4. So in Exodus 3.14, he reveals his covenant name, his name, and in, in, in the Bible, name refers to the essence, the nature of the thing. And that is Yod, He, Vav, He, Yehovah, Jehovah. And I had a slide with a picture, but it didn't work <laughs> of, the, of the actual text. So you'll hear me say Yehovah, Jehovah, Yehovah. That's why. That is I am who I am, or another way, I am that I am. There's that self existence. So we talked about that in reference to deity. Obviously, Jesus says I am, and everyone falls back because he's confessing 
that he is Jehovah. So the Father is Jehovah, the Son is Jehovah, the Spirit is Jehovah. Not three Jehovahs, one Jehovah. Deity. So as Richard A. Muller wrote in his Dictionary of Latin and Greek Theological Terms, the doctrine of the Trinity arises out of the church's reflection on the biblical declaration that God is one, but is known as Father, Son, and Spirit. So we went to the text, we saw that only that which can be properly predicated of God, which just means language used to describe, is used to describe the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. So then we had to figure out if we were going to be tritheists, and we had to figure out if we had to be monotheists that made the persons a non a non-real distinction, a non-real difference in the Godhead, in the essence, in the substance of God. Next slide, please. Okay. God's substance is his divinity, deity, Godhead, Godship, there it is, and therefore is most perfect and complete, com- perfectly, and therefore is most actual and real. This means that God's substance cannot be divided, and therefore the three persons cannot be parts, nor pieces slash divisions of his substance. Multiple substances means multiple gods. No persons means no biblical God. Once you have that, that means that what we say about the Father, well, what we say about the Son and the Spirit are blasphemy at minimum, as soon as you get rid of the persons as real persons. I'm not saying that Lutherans who follow after their scholastic forefathers do that, but that's what they'd have to do if they were being consistent. They'd have to say, oh, well, yeah, that's allegorical, or we, it's not the same kind of stuff that we would say about the Father. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's again, that degradation of the Son and the Spirit and the uplifting of the Father as to who he is in himself. We can't do that. We can't do that. And again, that's, that's just pressing things to their logical end. So Arminians, they want to believe that you can be saved apart from the word of God. So that's why they tell you that, no, the Trinity is not necessary for salvation. That's an Arminian conviction. It's coming to the Reformed Church. It's coming to the Presbyterian Church. You'll hear people say it's not essential for salvation. That goes back all the way to the Remonstrance. That's where that comes from. So Sinians say, oh, well, we can't understand the Trinity, so it must not exist. Or if it does exist, it's a mathematical relationship, it's a rational relationship, we can rationalize it away. It's not, there's a way that we can logically comprehend it apart from scripture, or in addition to scripture. To scripture. This is the two, the two kinds of Sassinianism as Sassinianism develops. When you, yeah, I gotcha. When, I read, when, when you read these things, those are two of the primary errors that we deal with. So I have a lot more, but I'm gonna wrap up right now. And... Hopefully I've come some way with you, if you go all the way back, all the way down to the last slide, Westminster Confession of Faith. Hopefully in hearing what I've said, and in kind of contrasting what the Bible has to say, don't mind the flashing screen, (laughs) hopefully in doing that, you now see why in order to defend God, we have to know who he is, we have to understand him as he's revealed himself, we have to love him accordingly, we have to live according to how he's revealed himself to be, and his standards, as it was spoken of. And then we have to defend that faith, right? All, all of those things, and many more things, are part of the faith, the faith once delivered to the saints. This is the faith we defend. And you defend it whether you realize it or not. When someone brings up something and you gently and lovingly correct them, which I would do, and I hopefully do, uh, even when I speak of my scholastically influenced Lutheran friends, trying to be doing this with gentleness, humility, respect, esteeming them above me. This is what you want to do, but it has to be the true God. You can't defend a God who doesn't exist. And all gods that, <laughs> all gods but the God revealed in the Bible, one God, three persons, don't exist. So finally, Westminster Confession of 2.3, in the unity of the Godhead, there be three persons of one substance, power and eternity. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. The Father is of none, proceeding from none, neither begotten nor proceeding. The Son is eternally begotten of the Father, the Holy Ghost eternally proceeding from the Father and the Son, sent from the Father and the Son. So with that, I don't know how long we have a break before Q&A, but thank you for your time and attention. Appreciate it. Thanks, Daniel. Okay, that ends our presentation tonight. 
Uh, if you would kindly stay, uh, we'll take a break. I think we have some, don't we have some refreshments in the back? And um, we'll come right back and then there'll be a panel discussion and you can ask, uh, ask questions. All right, thank you.
Um, so, yeah. What? Hey, so yeah. the question is: yes. Is it a bad thing to take yoga classes for purely fitness purposes? It doesn't say purely. I'll <clears> get into purely. Yeah. So purely fitness. Um, good question. I mean, actually, up until about six or seven years ago, I was taking a yoga class once in a while because it is a great workout, and I would work up a sweat. But at the end, they're doing the namaste thing, and I was I would just pray, but. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's a hard one. I, I, for, for myself, I wouldn't be going back, I think, after I thought about it. Um, I think it, there is a spiritual component to the fitness classes and um, the yoga, especially, you know, um, there's a worldview there, but how much are they? I, I don't know. I'm kind of stumbling here. That's a hard one. Um, so I'm thinking through if you're in a spinning class and the person has a different worldview than you and says, you know, pull up your energy or whatever, and uh, I don't know. What do you think, Daniel? <laughs> it, it's a very – I'm, I'm not being very clear about this. Sorry about that. So, yeah, I'm, certainly the stretching exercises, some of which are included in yoga, I don't know that there's anything in and of themselves that's um, – idolatrous it's the impression of what you do now when you go to a yoga class frequently it, it it just the fact that it's centered around yoga and the whole system probably implies some endorsement of the credibility of what's going on within the system and that the you know it's it's uh um i'm trying to think of another example that that you know, your presence there might endorse the credibility of the system. And, uh, and so certainly you might go for other reasons. You might go to meet people and talk to them about the Lord and how that system, you know, doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. Um, but uh, I think the exercises themselves, and I don't know all of them, certainly some of the names that are attributed to them and some of the thoughts are idolatrous. Um, but I think as far as certain types of stretches, I think there's, there's probably some good in them mm -hmm. and frequently, um, things that aren't good usually have something, some aspect of truth or some ap ap aspect of goodness to them that, uh, that gets you some traction, but then they're poorly contextualized. So, yeah, this is a tricky question. <laughs> you can find a yoga teacher, if you can, who will take away the spirituality, take away the world view out of it. And then if you can further ensure that you're not wounding any of your brothers or sisters consciences by being in that yoga class, then essentially what you have is a particular approach to stretching. And so I was blessed to find a teacher like that. I was not mature enough at that time to ask everybody, you know, to, is me being here making you think that the spirituality associated with these practices is okay, even though we don't teach it here, we don't learn it here? Uh, but that's a question that I would have challenged my younger self to ask because there were professing believers who were in that class with me. So it's, it's sort of a practice that I try to make uh, in going out. If I'm going to order a beverage that might be deemed controversial, I ask if anybody would be bothered by that. You can imagine what that... Like eating meat off its idols. Yeah. The great that Dr. Eddie, well put, Ruling Elder Eddie, MD, did a good job of talking about uh, it being parallel to... If there being a parallel between that and the eating of meat sacrificed to idols. So we just don't want to ever cause our brothers or sisters to stumble. So this is Q&A. Uh, we lost our... I almost said fearful... <laughs> our fearsome, our mighty moderator, but he, we thank him for his service. And uh, are there any questions in the room? Well, I submitted one online, but I'll ask since I'm here in person. Um, the Athanasian Creed regarding the Trinity is, you know, a very, seems to be very sound, but it's not common at all in any sort of Christian liturgy or confession of faith, really. I think a lot of people would probably be unfamiliar with it. And just wanted to get your comments on the Athanasian Creed. Oh, 
I can start. <laughs> I wasn't going to start, but I can start. Oh, yeah, it's, it's very sound. Um, the Reformed believers who hold to the three forms of unity, which are the Heidelberg or Heidelberg Catechism, the canons of the Synod of Dordrecht or the Synod of Dort, all these have different names, and the Belgic Confession. Those are their subordinate standards, like we have the Westminster Confession of Faith, which I ho hopefully was more intelligible and easier to understand by the end of my talk, and we have the Westminster Larger Catechism, and we have the Western Westminster Shorter Catechism. They are, you might hear about the Athanasian Creed more in those circles, and in certain of our own circles, you'll hear about it. I would say it's very, it's profoundly theologically sound. Um, one reason why I think people shy away from it is, as it's written, it says, if you don't believe these things, you're going to hell. And it says it very clearly, uh, and it says it repeatedly. It says it in the beginning, and it says it at the end. And I think a lot of people either cut that out, which I don't think is a good service to the, to the Athanasian Creed, uh, because they're saying this is the essence of the faith. You must believe and confess these things. Um, but obviously, we have to be pastorally sensitive, those who are pastors. Not me, um, but I do need to be sensitive <laughs> in conveying that to people so they understand we're not calling those people who wouldn't confess these things bad or evil, but yeah, that this is actually of the essence of what it means to be a Christian. So I think that's part of the reason why some shy away from it. It's also longer. Um, we like the shorter ones. That would be another reason. But yeah, it's great. That's, those are my two cents. Yeah, I don't have much to add. Yeah, Neither do I. Oh, okay. Thanks. Uh, okay, so... If you can, Elder first, Elder Bob first. Mm -hmm. So question for Elder Bob. Oh, this is from Patrick first. Hi, Patrick. Hey, Thanks. Patrick. Hey, Patrick. Oh, boy. Okay, well, let me brace myself. Before I hand it, sorry, wasn't thinking. All right, so this is from Patrick Parks, who was a deacon here, and we miss you dearly, and we love you and your family. We hope everyone is well. This is a very good question. What is your favorite Pink Floyd album? Is there anything instrumental for today's Christian apologists that can be learned or taken away from Alan Watts? Um, well, first of all, my favorite Pink Floyd album was Dark Side of the Moon. I wore it out on my record player. I would sit, and I never did drugs. Drugs scared me. But I would sit in the room, and it would be dark, and I would, I would listen. I would Big, put those big headphones on, and um, it was an amazing album. It really, it really is. Um, very hopeless album, though. At the very end, he says, there is no dark side of the moon. As a matter of fact, it's all dark. So I watched this um, documentary on the dark side of the moon with Roger Waters, who is, I believe, the bass player. And um, he would say, well, you know, it's not so dark because it means you've got to walk away from the darkness and walk to the light. But you just said, there's no dark side of the moon, it's all dark. So, he, you know, kind of contradicted himself. But great album. I think what was great about it was it was very um, existential. It was very emotional. It kind of captured the, the feeling of the 60s and the 70s. You know, it, it expressed that. Um, but again, very hopeless, but brilliant guys. So, Patrick, does that answer your question? Second. Alan Watts was a popularizer of Zen. He probably wrote 20 different books. And um, it was an American version of Zen. I don't think it was true Zen in terms of uh, when you really study under, under a Zen master. Um, Alan Watts was an um, intelligent guy, but it was watered down. So to answer your question, Patrick, um, I guess what not to believe? Patrick didn't ask me about Alan Watts, but I would like to say that where I usually interact with Watts is thinking, he's very popular on YouTube. He's been dead for I don't know how long, but he's got lots of lectures reposted and posted, millions and millions of hits. And where I try to go with it in defending the faith is consciousness, a source of consciousness, why we're rational, why we think, how does an unthinking universe produce thinking creatures, things like this. So try to take it to 
And also just what are you getting from it? This is what I always ask. Someone, oh, I'm listening to Jordan Peterson, which we talked about briefly in the in the break. As be, I, I think he's the most profound popularizer of Jungian thinking in American history. Um, and churches invite him to speak, so we better be able to <laughs> we better be able to to deal with his ideas, grapple with them. I don't think anybody around in our orbits will be inviting uh, Wayne Dyer to speak anytime soon. <laughs> But people we admire have had Jordan Peterson speaking there. So I always like to ask, what are you getting from this, whether it's Watts or Dyer or whoever they might be listening to? And what is it, what itch is it scratching? You know, what internal longing is it connecting to? And try to go from there, uh, just as a basic MO, a basic approach uh, with apologetics. And then he asks me a question. I, I was wondering if I'd get uh, any trouble for this. You stated that, quote, classical dispensationalism actually leads to modalism, end quote. Would you please elaborate or explain? Now, if I said actually, then that, I'd have to hear my own context. I may have misspoken. What I, it, there's a tendency, there's a tending towards uh, modalism. It's a very easy, short hop, skip, and a jump to modalism. Why? Because they, they separate the ages of the world into ages that corresponds to the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. That is a modalistic way of looking at the linear view of history. Because the age of the world, and indeed the eternal ages before the world, and all the ages that will exist after this world has passed into the glorious new heavens and new earth, are eternally Trinitarian. It's the age of the Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But what they usually mean is, well, there's an emphasis on the work of the Spirit. That's a different conversation. And so that's why I try to stress, if, if we take it to what that could mean, right? When they, say, when they say that there's a method of, so this is classical dispensationalism, mind you, listeners. Can you hear me? Oh, okay, we'll turn me up. This is classical dispensationalism, just so everybody's aware. This is not modern dispensationalism. They'll tell you that the way that the Jews were saved is different than the Gentiles. Okay, so that means that God changed his way of saving people. That means God changed. So their theology proper, if they actually are logically consistent with what they say they believe, is very much problematic in the way that I was describing. They're reading the Bible in a way that leads to these errors in theology proper. And then he says, I just wanted to share this with the three speakers and everybody here. Thank you to all three speakers, most edifying and educational, Jude 3. And yes, we must contend for the faith. Uh, so any questions in the room? I have no more questions as of yet online. Those of you watching, if you'd like to, search uh, Branch of Hope Q&A and the form will come up. If you put that in your search engine, we can take more if they populate. But does anyone have any questions in the room? And if not, I have a question for it. Oh, yes, thank you, please. Would you mind stepping up to the mic? Okay. I'm going into the Trinity question. So in, in Genesis 1, 2, it says that the, the darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. And then God creates the light and he creates all these things to the sixth day. But then in 26, God says, let us make man in our image. So is that when Jesus and the spirit are involved with God creating man? There is, and God said, which implies the word. So, you know, at the very beginning, right. the, you know, in the beginning, God created the heavens and earth, right. and the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the earth, and then God said, right. what's, 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 what's said but not said there is, is that the Word was there. What did God say, or what did God, what, what came, what proceeded from God, His Word, and who's the Word? The Son. So okay. the, the 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 sun is there, and he's 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 what's he's he's what proceeded in God speaking. Okay. Yeah, because it just read weird. Because right. why wouldn't he say us? Let us do make the light. Yeah. Or so yeah. The so they they were all present and part of the creation. All all the tri persons of the Trinity. 
Well, that's what I thought from yeah. the very beginning, but then you've got the spirit hovering over the waters, but yeah. it doesn't say the spirit's doing anything else. It just says mm. the spirit's over the waters. Yeah, I think that there is, when you look closely at the term there, it, it has something to do with almost a, a reverberation. And so I, it's as though the spirit is preparing the creation for the word to act upon it. Oh, almost as God. kind of the picture of regeneration. Um, in in uh, what is it, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, where Paul goes back to the creation and create makes an analogy, al analogy between God, you know, being in the act of creation and him making us a new creation. He's creating an analogy, and in that analogy, somehow the spirit affects us in the way that prepares us for the word of God to take action in us. It's kind of like called regeneration. That's good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Uh, so this is an example of what I was hoping to... It was there. I don't know how clear it came forward, but um, the idea that every, every work of God outside of himself is Trinitarian. And so creation must be Trinitarian because it's proceeding from the one God, yes, but the one God in three persons. So the Father is there, the Son is there, the Spirit is there. Very quickly, I, if you go to John 1, you'll see the Word was with God, the Word was God, and that nothing was made that was made but by Him. So throughout John 1, you'll see His role, and that's where said, right, so the Word is spoken, and then the Spirit Another word for spirit in Hebrew is the breath of God. The breath of God, the speaking of forth of the word, implicit in that too is the spirit. And then you see the spirit directly hovering over the face of the waters. And the spirit is, the spirit, there is a, there is a, a holy hiddenness of the spirit in that he magnifies Christ and doesn't really point to himself a lot. We see that explicitly in the New Testament, that he principally is revealing the Son not only, only to us, not only to us, but also convincing and reproving the world in righteousness. And then also that by divine illumination, he's making us understand these things more and more. But again, it's, it's by definition that God has to do everything in the three persons. So we see even involving the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. Of course, we'd never say that the Father died or the Spirit died, but we see the intimate involvement of the sending of the Son to the cross and the Spirit being involved in his raising from the dead. And also he was filled with the Spirit for his earthly ministry, preparing him all the way to Calvary, culminating in this act of passive obedience, which means this act of submitting to suffering and ultimately death upon the tree. So the Spirit's involved in his ministry even unto him giving himself up as an offering for the sins of the world. And we could do that with any doctrine you want. Any doctrine we can go to why it's necessarily Trinitarian. And again, talking about errors that have crept into the church, guys we respect, they say, oh, that makes, uh, that makes for panentheism, uh, which is God in everything. That's what they say. Whereas we would always understand with our forefathers uh, and our confessions that, of course, God's fingerprints are all over his creation. So those are Trinitarian fingerprints, of course, right? Because he's always been Father, Son, and Spirit. They c it can't be just the Father's fingerprints on creation. Now, people abuse that. It's called the vestigia trinitatis, and uh, some people go way too far with that and make analogies for the Trinity and so forth. But yeah, he, there's a Trinitarian set of fingerprints on everything that God has made. Just don't go too far with that because we want to always keep in line with Scripture. So that's a great question. And yeah, it, it's, that's why you need John 1 to make much clearer what's going on in Genesis 1. And that's that further elaboration of and enriching of and illumination of our understanding of the Trinity. And that's continuing today. Lord willing, I won't look back on this and say, oh, I should have said this or shouldn't have said that unless if I needed to. But yeah, we've, we've, there's a doctrinal development not only in our own personal theologies, but in the theology of the church as the church, in synods and in councils. So if you look at Nicaea versus a great question asked about Athanasian Creed, the Athanasian Creed is much further and well-refined and developed than Nicaea was, the Nicene Creed. It doesn't make it worse, and it's a bad, 
And the Apostles' Creed is even more of a brief outline than that. So you see development from the Apostles' Creed, which we're not, there's arguments about how early it is, but I think it was, had to be before Nicaea. I could be wrong, I guess. Then Nicaea, then Athanasian. And Athanasian Creed, I believe, was 457. Nicaea, I believe, was 315. And then we debate over how old the Apostles' Creed is. But that's just an example of we're always refining the, the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit is actually illumining and, and making our understanding of what's taught in his Bible that he is the author of better and better as we go, not by giving us new information to add to the Bible, to write into the Bible, but to clarify and enrich and enhance and improve our understanding of what's been written in 66 books. Any other questions? So I'm a little confused. Danny, you just said that uh, the breath of God is the Holy Spirit. Now, when we in our home group were going through Genesis and we were talking about the creation of man formed from the dust of the earth, God breathed his spirit into him. That was the only creation that God breathed into, so it's the only creation really that has a spirit, unlike animals and whatnot. Does that imply that believers and non-believers both have the spirit dwelling within them? Okay, this is a great question. And, and he reminds me, so right now, as we sit, we're about three to four minutes and about 0.3 to 0.4 miles away from where we have a home group in which we're studying, or a Bible study, in which we're studying Genesis. And that's what Carl, who always has good questions for me in the Bible study, is, is alluding to. So yes, in that, and if I wasn't sufficiently clear earlier, I apologize, uh, the word in Hebrew is, Hebrew, is, Hebrew, Hebrew is ruach, and that means wind, breath, spirit. And so when you see the spirit, it's the same word. That's why some translations will help helpfully capitalize when talking about the spirit of the Lord versus spirits common to man, right? Uh, and then that concept is taken up into, into Greek, uh, and that word is pneuma. So the doctrine of the spirit in, in theology is pneumatology, but pneumatology, the P is silent for most people, but it's... it's Allegedly said in Greek, who knows how koine was pronounced, right? But, but so the same concept is there in both testaments. So to your, so is the spirit of the Lord being given to Adam in the sense of regeneration? No, because he doesn't need regeneration yet. It's in creation that he's given a spirit of his own, okay? And then that spirit, along with his body, falls in the fall, and he needs regeneration, and that's where the spirit indwells him in the way that he regenerates believers. And so there are common operations of the Spirit, just like there are com all, all Trinitarian works are common works, meaning shared between the three persons. There are common operations of the Spirit in the world. So on, on believers and unbelievers, if you look at what the Spirit does, he gives gifts that have nothing to do with saving you. But the salvific gifts are, of course, reserved for those he effectually calls, those he regenerates. So then that's a giving of the Spirit in addition to this creative, the giver of life, the creator of all these wonderful gifts that you see that would be under common operations of the Spirit. You'll see that in our own confession and catechisms. You'll see that in a lot of the theologians we like, John Calvin. Some people here really like Abraham Kuyper. I'm not as big of a fan, but he wrote a whole book about uh, common operations of the Spirit. Um, yeah, we've... So there's a sense in which the Holy Ghost is, because he's, he's obviously at work, as is the Father, as is the Son, one God, at work in the creation. He's doing all this stuff providentially in providence, but not all of that results in the saving work of the Spirit that we focus on in the church, particularly in sharing the gospel. Is that helpful? Okay, well, let Dr. Eddie get on this too. Yeah, and then on. Yes, it, it does. So, so it just so, is there a, there's a spirit within everybody, believer and non-believers, and then there's a spirit of salvation that believers have only. Is that correct? Um, the spirit of God that comes, you know, that, that comes to us and dwells in us. Um, you know, that's the spirit of God. Let, let me t t tackle it from a different perspective. Okay. And this is a little speculative, so I may get beaten up on it. Um, in, uh, I believe it's 1 Samuel, somewhere around 16, it talks about how the Spirit left Saul. Yeah. And then some other Spirit came into him. 
And in that, he, in that time, he seemed to have a drastic change in his thinking and his behavior. Um, and so if we think of one aspect of the spirit as being a personalized collection of ideas, uh, I'm not trying to say that the spirit is limited just to a collection of ideas, but if there is communication from the spiritual world into our realm, it seems to be through ideas and through a collection of ideas. I've treated many anorexic women, and um, they talk about their disease in a personified form. You know, that has all these, it has all these different beliefs, all these ideas, and they're connected. They're all interrelated to each other. And it, it's, it's so interconnected that one of the struggles with them is they feel when they're going in through treatment, they feel as though they're, they're um, abandoning their best friend. And they even will uh, give that, that collection of ideas a name. And, and they'll say, you know, they'll have this real intimate relationship with this collection of ideas. Um, and so I'm not saying that, that the Spirit of God is just a collection of ideas, but the Spirit of God comes to us with the Word of God, and they both dwell in us. And the Word of God is a personal collection of ideas. You know, there's many ideas that are part of the Word of God. And, yeah, you know, it, if my words abide in you and my commands abide in you, I think it's like, John 14, 15, 16, it gets repeated that if the words, God's words, Christ's words, command, commands come and abide in you, the, the Father and the Son will come and make their home within you. And so again, their words, their commands, there's all these collections of ideas that come into you. So the fallen man is ruled by a collection of ideas that is not godly. It's actually rebelling against the triune God of Scripture. And so um, it also kind of touches on the whole idea of the image of God. You know, that God, man was created in the image of God, and then after the fall, that image was somehow marred and distort, distorted. Really quickly, what, did you want to add to that? No, I think you should write a book. <laughs> so... The, when we talk about, just to go back to the common operations of the Spirit really quickly, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. What R.C. Sproul called the most dreadful verse in the Bible or scariest verse in the Bible. So obviously, it's not the spirit of man, nor is it the spirit of uh, the devil, the spirit of the evil one, or any of the fallen spirits motivating you to do all those good works. That's a common operation of the spirit. And yet, they didn't have the saving, indwelling presence of the spirit. So just to really quickly dovetail on and highlight on what Eddie was saying, not so much about what the idea part, that's, we can talk about that in a different sense, but in the Old Testament, it's much clearer, but you'll still see it. I mean, I think it's clear for this text right here. You'll see that there's a resting upon someone of the Spirit versus the indwelling, the living within of the Spirit inside of someone. So the Spirit can be on someone to do a work, raised up, raise up a king. I raised up the king, and actually all kings are raised up by God anyway, but could be, could be given great gifts to do things, and then that spiritual empowering could be removed, but we would never say that king was saved. Uh, I actually, uh, I had to write about Saul in seminary, and I'm convinced that he was unsaved. I'd like to be wrong, but because of that precipitous decline after 1 Samuel 16, verse 14, where the spirit is removed and an evil spirit comes and troubles him, you see, oh boy, his life, wow, his life really changes. And so I argued from that, yeah, that I don't think and I hope I'm wrong. I hope he was. But that's something we've talked about. There's a good sermon series uh, preaching through 1 Samuel by a man in Mebbin, North Carolina, minister of the gospel named Gavin Beers. Very good and helpful in these parts. But yeah, that's a great question. Um, did that clarify the which kind of spirit? And yeah, because we all do have a human spirit. Jesus had a human spirit in his human nature. Otherwise, he wouldn't be fully man. 
but yeah, we don't all receive the indwelling spirit of the Lord in salvation. That would be the difference between those who are elect and those who are not. I do have a question for y'all, if you don't have any more questions, which is, was anything unclear, <laughs> anything that needed clarifying in my talk? Not these fine gentlemen's talks, I'm sure they don't, they were great, but anything that really was confusing? I'm asking in the room, but people online can also answer. And I, oh good, we got some more questions online too. Nice. Okay, no, that's fine. Uh, so let's go to online. Oh, I, I, I know somebody who's asking a question. So Damien Perez asks, I don't know if I've met you, Damien, but I do know Anthony. Can you elaborate some thoughts on liberty of conscience and legalism? For example, can someone, liberty of conscience, to think something can lead to a sin, such as drinking alcohol, enjoying music like metal, or wearing clothes like ripped up jeans and metal band t-shirts, etc.? Can that lead to something that's considered legalistic? More specifically, my question is, how do I respond to another Christian who advises against these things? Well, um, I like I like rock and roll music, but I stopped listening to ACDC and folks like that um, when I became a Christian, just because hey, I like the I like the, uh, the the power chords and the drum and the bass, but you know what, the lyrics are just not edifying. So, um, yeah, rock and roll T-shirts depends on what's on the shirt, you know. I mean, maybe uh, you could, Dark Side of the Moon was probably the best-selling shirt in the history of rock and roll t-shirts. I, I work in a screen printing facility, and we screened thousands of those things, and it's a great logo. So maybe it could be a good witnessing tool, like I talked about, you know, if you wore the Dark Side of the Moon shirt, and, you know, it'd be a good entree. But I guess, um, I don't know if that answers your question. It's hard. It's a hard one. We had a... We have a question um, about um, wearing hats in church. Um, came to the elders. So um, where do you draw the line, All right? Yeah, there's a, kind of the whole concept of protecting the weaker brother from, I believe it's like Romans 14 and, uh, and for uh, 1 Corinthians 8. And so we all have to be conscious of how our actions affect those around us, um, you know, when it when it becomes questionable, is then you know where do you draw the line? Where is it you know that the Bible clearly states that you shouldn't engage in a particular behavior, or you, that you should? It gets a little bit a little bit blurrier in those in those areas. Uh, it doesn't really talk about um, wearing certain kind of jeans, but it does talk about the general nature of how we ought to dress, you know, that not necessarily in a way that specifically calls attention to ourselves, because then that would be kind of like putting ourselves in a place of an idol. Uh, so, so we need to be personally conscious about those things. Yeah, there is affect the people around us, and how they affect the people around us. Yeah, and I've had people say, well, it doesn't that subjectivize Christian living. Like, don't you, so now it's about other people's feelings. No, the, the text is clear that if, if I'm to harm someone by my liberty, then that's not a proper use of my liberty, right? All things are lawful, but not everything is expedient. Not all things are expedient. So it's, there are things that, and that, that's speaking to our freedom in Christ. Now, of course, that can't mean that sinful things are lawful, because that, that would be say that, that that would be a direct contradiction. The lawless thing is lawful. No, that's not what the text is saying. So the first thing you need to do is when we're talking about whether it's legalism or not. Now, very quickly, the church now says legalism, and they don't mean salvation by the law, which is what legalism has meant historically. They mean uh, adding to the law of God. Usually, what they're talking about is something that I would call Pharisaicalism, Pharisaism, Pharisaic behavior, right? Being like a Pharisee, adding to the law of God making it easier to keep or harder to keep, you know, taking away from it or, you know, adjusting it, doing what the Pharisees are famous for, or known for even to this day. Uh, the whole Talmud is full of Pharisaic innovations on the law of God. 
lots of rabbinical commentary outside of the Talmud is as well. So first you say, so is drinking lawful, is drinking alcohol lawful in and of itself? If the answer is yes, then is it regulated by scripture? Yes, it is. Be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Ghost. Okay, so there's my principle for drinking alcohol. But I don't want to use my liberty to, as an occasion for someone else to stumble. Wearing clothes like ripped up jeans, are they immodest? Are they attracting undue attention to myself? If they are, probably not. Same thing with metal t-shirts. But of course, there is no thou shalt not wear ban t-shirts. And again, when and where are we wearing these things and why? What are they for? Uh, but in and of themselves, I mean, if we all somehow knew that showing whatever amount of leg shows in ripped up jeans is not attracting undue attention, it'd be hard to make a biblical argument uh, that that would be something unlawful in itself. Then finally, how do I respond to another Christian who advises against these things? Now, if another Christian, Damien, is advising you, is saying, hey, I think this is helpful advice, then you can say, oh, I thank you for your advice, and you can take it or not. If they're saying this is about you being saved, or this is about you being in right standing with the Lord, right relationship to the Lord, that's where we have a bigger problem. So I might give counsel. I, maybe I can't listen to music that my brothers here on the panel, my elder brothers, pun intended, on the panel can listen to. They might have liberty to listen to things that I can't. I might have liberty to listen to things that they can't. We might wear different clothes out of, you know, principle, out of conviction. But that principle of liberty is preserved because none of us are saying, you're a sinner because you don't do it exactly the way I understand it. So it's, it's what it, Bob, ruling elder Bob mentioned earlier, it's the principle of edification. Is this edifying? He found those lyrics that he used to enjoy not to be edifying, so he got rid of them. What he's not doing, I don't think, is running around telling everybody who listens to AD, ACDC that they're an unrepentant sinner. But a great question. And always, it's a perennial question. Antinomianism, which is against the law, is known as the golden white devil. That's what, how he described because it appeared as an angel of light saying, hey, it's just grace. All grace, that's something we have to guard against. Pharisaicalism has an equally low view of the law because it makes the law keepable. You don't need Jesus anymore because you can perfectly keep the law. You can keep the law in and of yourself. But of course, only Jesus is the perfect law keeper. So uh, uh, an insight that's been profoundly helpful to me is they both actually share a low view of the law of God because one makes it easy to keep and the other says, no more law, all grace. You know, uh, God loves to forgive and I love to sin. Antinomianism. Yeah, Anthony. All right, well, last one. Uh, it's a tough one. Anthony Homer, you should come to the conference, Anthony. <laughs> uh, we have Bonson coming up again. The breath of life question is being responded to. Only the first two had that breath breathed into them upon their creation, yes? Since then, is it not a traducian way whereby all sins are born of man and that regeneration is our breath of life moment given by God? It certainly keeps his hands clean from the sin ingredient. <laughs> all right, so traducianism. Traducianism, traducianism, that comes from the root. Okay, so the idea is that all humanity is descended from Adam and Eve, particularly Adam as our covenantal head and representative, body and soul. The best argument for this is that it keeps the imputation of sin from getting to Jesus, to getting to the Father, to from getting to the Holy Spirit. The imputation of sin meaning, so Adam's guilt gets re-imputed, gets re-credited to the account of every new soul that God puts in a baby. That's the, probably the best argument for traducianism. That is not, you'll notice, supported by the text directly. Um, the problem here for the text in question, which is I, he, he was alluding to the Genesis text, is uh, we have a difference in how Adam was created and how uh, Eve was created. And so people will say that uh, Eve's soul is somehow like a break off of Adam's soul. That's a problem. Because now, she, male and female created he them is lost. There's not an identical image of God in both Adam and Eve. So that would be a problem that Traducians would have to guard against. The other position is soul creationism, which I talked about briefly. Soul creationism is the majority report of the church. Doesn't make it true, it just means many more theologians believe it. And that means that at the point of conception, God gives the soul to an infant, a new soul. 
So the biggest problem for that is, it, is God doing a new work of creation, and there's good arguments for why this is not a new work of creation every time, after he is said to have rested from his creation ex nihilo, right? Creation from nothing. So that would be the good argument against that. So it's a tough issue. Um, I think we have to be kind of like the Lapsarian question, which is order of decrees. When, when did God decree the fall, the fall of man? And when did he decree uh, the, those who would be saved and those who would be damned? How, how does that work? I think we need to be understanding of our brothers and sisters of different positions, and we should work to understand these things and come to a position. But yeah, no, to tie it to the breath of life moment, um, because it is the insoling of Adam at the point of creation and not the, at the point of recreation, not at the point of being born from above, but at the point of birth, I wouldn't say that this is the best text for Traducianism, no. Now, how clear was that for everybody? <laughs> Close in prayer. All right. We got a lot of stuff to think about and sleep over. Uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for... Um, coming together, bringing us together to uh, think about your word, uh, to try and guide people to truth. Um, we thank you for your revelation to us. We thank you for the church. Uh, we call that uh, call to all of people to be united to one body and to one church under Christ. Um, we thank you for your blessings. We pay for those that haven't been able to make it, and we hope that this goes out through a variety of channels. Uh, to build your kingdom in Jesus' name. Thanks for hanging out.